Okay, folks, we are ready to go. It is 6.30, and uh, I will call our meeting to order. I'll start by asking our uh, council members who are participating remotely to uh, identify themselves. Uh, Adrian? Hi, this is Adrian Gill, District 1. Uh, Carrie? This is Carrie Brown, District 3. Um, Lauren? Hi, Lauren Hurl, District 1. All right, thank you. Um, I'll mention a little bit of our logistics for the meeting. Um, anyone appearing remotely, we would ask you to change your name to your uh, first and last name so that we know who we're talking to and who's talking to us. Anyone who speaks, we would also ask that you State your start out by stating your name and where you telling us where you live. We ask everyone to keep your comments and questions to three minutes, and we will have assistance to keep track of the time. Uh, anyone who wishes to speak must be called on by the mayor. And again, keep your time c comments and questions to three minutes. We generally don't allow uh, back and forth between members of the council and members of the public. So if you have things that you need to say or questions you need to ask, we'll ask you to get them all out. And with that, um, is everybody ready to approve the agenda? Any uh, requested changes? Hearing none, I'll take the agenda to be approved. First item is general businesses, business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any topic that is not on tonight's agenda. Um, as with other elements of the agenda, we would ask you to keep your comments to three minutes and uh, we'll start with people in the room. Come on up. Lisa Edson Neva, 195 State Street. I'm actually really disappointed to be back here again this week. Last council meeting two weeks ago, I thought it was a pretty reasonable ask to ask for a written document with the plan, with the timeline, with who's responsible for the different steps of the elevation. A lot of you agreed with me. You nodded. You agreed that this was a reasonable ask. It's been another two weeks and we don't have it. We don't have the communication that we asked for. This afternoon, about three hours ago, we got an update, which I appreciate as communication in terms of knowing some of the steps that are going on, but we don't have those timelines, those same timelines that each of you expect in the city budget and in the city plan. It's been a year and a half. It's worth recognizing that my family is the only one living in the home with a substantial damages letter and we are not allowed to repair. The letter that you issued to us last September, more than a year ago, prevents us from making repairs until we're elevated. So you hold us hostage. We can't move forward. We can't repair. If we repair, it's not covered by insurance. We cannot do anything until you move forward but you have it and you've backburnered us and openly said things like when we wrap up our other projects and that keeps us where we are. And I don't understand why it's happening. So I'm back again asking simply for a timeline with actual items and, and actual due dates. And if those flex, they flex, but we need to have a plan. We need to know what's going on. And we need to be included in the decision making. In the developmental disability world for years, it's always been don't make decisions about us without us. And this is the same thing. You shouldn't be making decisions that hugely impact every part of our lives without at least including us in those or at least letting us know. So I'm back again asking for the same thing I asked for two weeks ago, a written plan and a written plan of communication so we can move forward. Thank you. Do you have anything? I can't hear anything. Sit closer. I agree with you. Um, 
it's the situation is basically the same thing as it was two weeks ago. We have submitted everything to the state. We had as of two weeks ago, as of Monday, we don't have their subgrant agreement, which will tell us the timeline that we need to do everything. Uh, we've pestered them a couple times asking them for it. And I think ultimately let, let you know where that was. We were hoping to contact you saying we now have it. Let's sit down and work out the timeline as soon as we get the subgrant agreement and we know what purchasing products we can't we can't tell you anything because we don't know anything. So I certainly appreciate your frustration. We don't know what they're going to require us for purchasing. We don't know what they're going to require us for bidding. We don't know any of this until we get it. And we've been waiting not so patiently for it. So I I feel I understand and um I you know, I, I wish we could give you your timeline and we will as soon as we can. Reply to because we've been communicating for quite a while here. It, it, my understanding is this money is coming from FEMA through the state, and this is not something the city of Montpelier controls. It isn't. And we don't, like, let me finish. We don't even have our city hall or our fire station fixed yet, and we don't have timelines or details. So I appreciate what you're asking, but this isn't a situation that we're in absolute control of. Our staff has worked to get the paperwork done to help you and work things along as much as we can. Some communities haven't approved situations like yours, as you know, I'm sure you've read in the Argus. Um, we're trying, but to tell you we can give you a report every two weeks like you asked for last time, when we left that meeting, I'm like, it's just not realistic because we're not in control of this thing. So I think you need to hear those words because if you're getting the illusion we are, it's not true. Well, first of all, the money isn't coming from FEMA. It came from the legislature. It's the 3.5 million that was okay. authorized to be authorized through Vermont Emergency Management. Okay. So no, it isn't FEMA. And to have you lay this back on me, not... when we cannot repair, we don't have walls, we don't have ceilings, there's insulation falling, the apartment buildings repaired, the Airbnb was able to repair, they were able to use the exceptions of a uh, historic building and they fought the substantial damages. We were told that if we did that, we weren't eligible for the money. So you sold our story over and over again for the 514000 and then for the $3.5 million, and now you're telling me, oh, the police station isn't done, the fire station. We okay. live in this every okay. day. We have massive loans we cannot use because you all have not moved forward. It's it's not because the city hasn't moved forward, but you, you've moved, made your point. Um, I'll call on the next person. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the room who's seeking to be recognized? Steve Whitaker, as I recall that last conversation, you did agree that it was fair to ask for notice. And I, it would have been as simple as no, no new developments in the city manager's report, something to honor the fact that these people are, are hanging out on a limb and it's not that hard to do. So, so right. since, since you know all about this, we got a notice from the state saying we they were be sending us the subgrant agreement after they did this, 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 and we forwarded it. my clock while he right. rambles. That's right. And we forwarded it to her so that she knew what was going on as soon as we had information. Well, I, I, I think, uh, let me suggest that a, a section of the city manager's report make everybody in town aware of how diligently we're trying and how long what waiting loop we're stuck in but the the disdain i hear for folks for victims of this flood you know it in the tone of voice and in the defensiveness and in the outright anger animosity is is just take a look at it um cloud recording i plant the housing committee lost its recording several times and then there's a big blank space the rosemary you know i'm reminded of nixon's uh rosemary erasure uh when the housing committee was discussing a very sensitive topic about appeals uh you're not then, you're not suggesting that someone from the city has intentionally erased the i've never seen it audio version. only disappear when the video is there I'll just leave it at that. But in this case, I noticed the sign up on the wall, and I wish, again, a request a year later, two years later, to delamp the center lamp so we can see the screen. It's it's the center fixture delamped would allow us to be able to see names and stuff up there. But the I was the one who noticed cloud recording available, which meant that the recording had 
my baby stopped and I had to ask her to pay attention to it and to go restart the recording. So we're, we might be missing some of tonight's meeting. And that requires a, this is the law that we require these meetings. This is not, you know, a optional play thing. So, um, dig safe Monday morning, the backhoe ripped open a conduit, which appeared to have a 288 strand fiber, uh, in it, which could well be, the first light fiber that serves our radio dispatch and our police phone lines and our city phone lines. Luckily, they didn't sever the cable, but they severed the conduit. And I got no response when I asked for the dig safe report because apparently Montpelier, which is required due to our being in the heat business, providing a utility service, we are required to, as a city, to be a member of dig safe and to report any damage done. And we haven't been doing that. So I'm just calling that to your attention. It it appeared that the conduit was repaired with some thinner material. It's way close to the surface. And I don't think the metal strip was put in to be located. But once the grading happened off of School Street, where they graded the surface to get ready to put new pavement down, it, it would have been smart to call DigSafe again and have them remark the utilities before you start doing excavation work uh that's your time no it, fraser took some of my time no it was paused you did that you need a policy on sandwich boards prohibiting them or notifying them not to leave them out in the middle of the sidewalk to move them to the building side or the curb side okay. and i'll talk about growth center later okay is there anybody else in the room who'd like to be uh, heard And is there anyone online? Uh, uh, I neglected to mention that anyone who's participating remotely, the easiest way to make sure you're recognized is to use the electronic uh, raise hand feature on uh, on Zoom. Uh, Nicole Schaefer. Hi. Um I'm just wondering if uh, counselors can please identify themselves when speaking, because although I acknowledge that you all have placards, they're not visible from the Zoom screen. So that would be super helpful. Thank you. Oh, thank you. That's that's very interesting. I, I see what you mean. The the people on seated on the council are at the table are Palin Cone. I'm going from my left to the right. Palin Cohn, Tim Heaney, uh, City Manager Bill Fraser, myself, uh, Jack McCullough, Council City Clerk John Odom, and Councillor Sal Alfano. And we have members online who've, who've introduced themselves. Um, I do not see any other hands raised, so I'll move to the next order of business which is uh, the consent agenda is there a motion to approve the consent agenda so moved. is there a second all those in any discussion all those in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. any opposed okay thank you Next up, homelessness follow-up discussion. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, last week we had a special meeting uh, discussing homelessness and um, actually suggestion from Council Member Heaney that we should put this on this meeting just for follow-up conversation, see where everybody was uh, where everybody was with this. We you know where the, we heard from the state, we heard from members of the public, and then Council Member Hurl and summarize some thoughts at the end but the council themselves never really had a follow-up conversation so we felt we should spend a few minutes on that before we got into our other business sounds good anybody want to start I, i'll start i i thought it was a it was a good meeting it was uh there were a lot of uh points of view expressed i would have been uh happier if I'd known how uh, small the number of uh, families who were going to be uh, housed in the in the shelters that 
the state's opening in Washington County before the meeting, because I probably would have uh, had some questions for uh, Commissioner Winters about that. Um, but we've got a list, and in the council packet, we have a list of uh, topics that Councillor Hurl came up with at, at our last meeting. It's, certain, it may, it's not necessarily exhaustive, but it's a suggest list of things that we could that we identified at the meeting as for future potential future action and that those include call on state to reinstitute institute the hotel program until a more comprehensive plan is implemented explore declaration of a public emergency or some other strong resolution perhaps in con conjunction with other communities consider concluding funds in the upcoming budget review the city's encampment policy, support the state's efforts for additional shelter space in Montpelier, urge the legislature to raise revenue to address this issue, and urge the legislature to invest in housing. Um, I can say that uh, as to those last two, uh, urging the legislature to do things, uh, we're setting up a meeting of our uh, Legislative Committee to talk about what uh, what's going to be on our legislative agenda agenda, and I can't imagine that uh, items like this addressing both homelessness and housing will not be once again high priorities for for the city. But uh, the committee hasn't met yet, and when we do meet, we will bring our ideas for the legislative agenda to uh, back to council. For adoption. Yeah, Tim. For me, I think Lauren's list was good. The, the piece I would still want to add to it is um, apparently the state is considering opening family shelters in three locations, and one is Montpelier. So it seems like anything we can do to support that and get it happening quickly before the legislature comes back, um, I think would be a really key step. Uh, that and obviously calling on the state to reinstitute the hotel program to get through this season till we can work things out would be the other key one because we need some now solutions. And I think those two are more in that category. Yep. So we talked a little bit about um, putting a group of towns together to declare a state of emergency, even though we can't do anything with it. But it, if if enough of the municipalities got together it might um, add a little, little more incentive for the state to to move on the on the other asks that we've made. Any is there any sense that that might happen? I think reach out to our the communities we've been working with on this. Uh, we're going to a representative sample of us are going to be um, meeting tomorrow. I think tomorrow or Friday uh, to take this up further. There seem to be a consensus that we that a joint resolution or statement might be welcome. There really isn't, I, I did research, there really isn't any state of emergency that we can declare that does anything. And and some were more, some were less happy about using those terms since we can't do it. But they, I think there's definitely a consensus that we take a strong statement as a group of communities and, or, you know, we can talk about it in an emergency situation. We just, I don't think I don't think we'll get a group of people to jointly declare a state emergency, but we can probably get a group of people to jointly adopt the same resolution calling for action. That would be my sense. I'll know more at the end of the week. Well, it sounds it just sounds similar to the statement that that has already been made that you made at the at the press conference. Uh, That's true. Um, I think there's a major difference there in that, um, you know, that was made. So, I mean, you were notified, but, it, you know, wasn't really adopted by the elected bodies of all those communities. It was a lot of managers, a lot, you know, individual mayors, those kind of things, but actually having governing bodies in a bunch of communities taking a vote saying, you know, this is, and, and you know, maybe put, adding some of these strongly, you know, maybe making it less long and just kind of these are, the high points. One other question: um, Do we have we heard anything from the state about 
the uh, shelter that they're considering the city where they might? No, no. Yeah. That, that is a logical expectation. <laughs> yeah, if they're going to do something quickly. Yeah. Well, I know, I know they're, um, it's, it's, they've said it would be, uh, there'd be some delay before they set up the one in Montpelier. I'm not sure exactly why renovations or something, but, um, I wonder what the chances are that <clears throat> they would go so far as to, um, permit the use of that building as a, you know, a, a permanent day, day shelter. Well, we, we just have to keep pushing them. Yeah, when, when we hear from them, we we ought to ask that question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Carrie. Yeah, thanks. Um, I appreciate the list of things we might be able to do, and one of them is review the encampment policy, and um, that might be a big thing that we want to tackle right now. But I, I would like to go back to um, the the decision to make the entire Country Club Road property to classify it as high sensitivity. I wonder if we might be able to kind of step back from that and look a little bit more thoughtfully at the whole property and think about maybe there are sections of it that would fall into that high sensitivity category, but maybe there are sections that wouldn't out of a hundred and some acres. Maybe there are spots where people could camp and it would not interfere with um, the rest of the public's opportunity to use the land. Um, it's just a lot of land to just kind of declare off limits, high sensitivity. Um, I'm not sure it's, it, I, I would like us to look at that again and see if there isn't a way to be a little bit more discerning about how we apply that to that property. Want to put that on the agenda for our next meeting? Sure. Okay. Yeah, I think that's right. I think it obviously deserves input from city staff as part of it, but uh, but we'll have that on our next agenda. Um, any thoughts, other thoughts from members of the council before I start taking comments from the public? Okay, Steve, I saw you up first, so. You know, I, I, Steve Whitaker again. I think what we need to do, and I said this at the meeting last week, we need to write a local plan. We need to put a budget together. We need to seek support from the state. I understand DCF had 10 million, VHCB had 10 or more million for emergency housing. Uh, none of that is accessible without a plan. And we have refused to do a plan. Our homelessness task force has refused to do a plan for five years. So I think you need to merge the homelessness task force and the housing committee and give them a directive of completing a plan in X amount of time. Uh, the housing committee does have capable people and uh, this shouldn't be a predominant piece of their work, but it could be a emergency housing is part of housing committee's work. Uh, the Barry Berlin and Montpelier could potentially uh, agree on a state of emergency because we're all wrestling with it in our separately. And it's true. It wouldn't have any legal or binding effect, but it would have, it would certainly have more effect than street painting letters in the street uh, to basically have a unified voice that these central Vermont, our capital city uh, and these neighboring towns are been in effect sharing a, an unhoused population. Uh, the counts are not accurate that you've been hearing. They're an undercount by either 0.5, meaning that we could potentially be up to double the amount you're hearing about. You're hearing only the coordinated ca case entry. The, the numbers that Good Sam gives you only come from the database that they are collecting, and there's a lot of people that won't go anywhere near that. There's a lot of folks in cars, in tents, and, you know, uh, I noticed a, a little tent out. I won't say where while we're on the record. Um, the family shelter is probably only going to be a handful of people. I I, I heard from uh, the owner of Six Court Street that he had offered that building to the city and couldn't get a return call months ago, many months ago. So you can dispute that. I don't claim to have all the facts. I just know that that's a building with an two empty floors or three empty floors 
and one level street accessible that could, it may be more appropriate for single room occupancy as a step up from camping, but I think we should implement immediate camping. There is a sensitivity you need to be aware of. The current population of the Good Samaritan run shelter uh, cannot easily mix with some of the troubled folks that would tend to camp outside there. So there needs to be some management agreement over who the most benign of campers be allowed to be uh, in that area. Because the mix between those trying to get out or in with drugs or alcohol would could disrupt what we've got going for 20 people. So that's a that's a very real issue uh, that could be addressed, but it it's a challenge. I'll stop there. Thanks to you. I think you're talking about Seven Court Street, but I think we know yeah. the building. Yeah. Okay. Not to dispute with Steve about anything, but just comment was made in public, and I want to make sure it's clear. The city was not offered that property. Good Sam was, and there was a negotiation that happened, and the Good Sam put money in their request to the state to purchase that building and it was not part of what was awarded um, because the state in fact we had this conversation the state said their 10 million was only to operate shelters it wasn't to buy buildings uh, and i would say there was also again i don't want to speak for either party but from my understanding there was a substantial difference in the price that property was offered for versus what others felt its market value was and uh, what its appraisal was. So it um, there was an active negotiation. It was not the state. Um, and it was not the city. And so that's what happened. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Zach. Yeah, this is Zach Hughes, uh, District 3 area. Um, and um, I'm going to continue to say that I'm still kind of thinking the state's not going to come through uh, for us based on the current trajectory. Um, it would be easier to have the legislature in session so we could have possibly more pressure. Um, but I'm not seeing anything. I, I'm i um, not feeling it. And um, so I'm wondering if that doesn't happen by chance, and it will happen probably, but it it may not happen based on the attitudes. And it's, it's about values we have. And I'm preaching to the choir here. It's about values. And we need to look at all those and uh, figure that out. Um, and, you know, there might be things that we can do. Uh, you know, I, I know we've been exploring that in task force and, you know, I and I appreciate the opinions of what we have done in the last five years. Um, but what we have done is uh, uh, more than anything I've seen in the city in 20 years. I just want to put that out here right now. I And it's tremendous. It's work. It's not easy work. And um, so I respect that opinion. I just, again, I would urge the city to look at things they can do because I, what I was reading is it said, we can't do it. Uh, we got to do something, though. I And we have to continue to realize that, as I said, camping is going to continue to happen regardless. Um, thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thanks, Zach. Uh, Tori? I, I want to appreciate um, Councillor Brown's um, comment about really looking in a much more careful way at um, which areas, if any, of the Country Club Road property actually are highly sensitive areas where people shouldn't camp and which areas might um, be used for camping. Um, the task force certainly does not support um, I don't. I don't think any humane person would support camping in the winter or camping with kids as um, how people should have to live. But given that that's the situation that we're having right now, one of the things I know that the task force um, was asking for when we wrote up um, the things that we wrote in preparation for the meeting last week was that there be um, a place carefully um, considered in the city where people legally can camp. Um, where they can legally camp and they can safely camp. Um, the um, I so that's 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 my main that's my main concern. I think that I think the um, encampment policy does have to be revisited. It has to be clear when areas are considered to be highly sensitive why that is, 
and how that can be appealed. Um, and, and there needs to be, un, until we get people indoors, there's got to be a place that people can camp safely. Thank you. Thanks. Any, any other thoughts on this for members of the council? Oh, Meredith Warner. Mm -hmm. Hi, Meredith. Thanks for joining us. Hi. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for being here. Uh, grateful for this conversation. Um, mm -hmm. I am the deputy director at Good Samaritan Haven. I also serve as uh, interim co-chair of the Homelessness Task Force, along with Zach. Uh, we had a, a great subcommittee meeting today talking about the task force budget recommendations for the upcoming year. And I think, and I'm I'm excited to share those with the task force uh, this next Wednesday, and then also to forward them all along to you. And I'm hopeful there, there are some generative, interesting ideas in there for all of you to, um, to think about. None are super short term, but, um, but maybe could get the ideas going for that. Um, so, uh, and then I also just wanted to remind folks in terms of state process that um, people that ran out of their 80 days starting around September 19th are out of those 80 days. Um, and, and they'll, and once they're back in uh, for those who need it using the winter shelter, there will be another date in April that uh, people will fall out of shelter again. So I know that feels despairing, but I, I also want to say like, this really is the time for us to be uh, tending to folks who really need support right now, but also prepping for, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a potential addition of people um, in April that will need support as well. So just keeping that in mind. Thanks, Meredith. I think those are great points. I also keep coming back to the fact that that we hear from everyone that what what is and what we heard from Chris Winters last week is that what we need for shelter and stand up housing are a willing willing community a building and providers and we have a willing community in Montpelier we don't yet have an identified building and the providers in the city are strained to the max already so a lot of it involves pressuring the state for money, which we're going to continue to do. Anything else before we move off this one? We'll, this, the, uh, the legislative committee is going to meet and we'll come back uh, probably in the next meeting or two. Um, the uh, We'll hear from Bill what happens with it at his next meeting and we'll keep keep working on this. Okay, moving to item seven, Country Club Road Recreation Update. Uh, yeah, so this is a follow-up to our last meeting when we had uh, received the report from Power Wellness, the, the first stage of the, the phase one study. And um, so you all heard that, that was released publicly. At that meeting, members of the hub um, sort of publicly made off made their offer known. We've shared that letter with you and some information about the the purchase price. That certainly, uh, and then we've looked at this. So my, uh, I will start saying where I came down on this, and obviously you, the council, can do whatever you want with it. Um, but my view is to try to stay on the linear the same linear track we've been on which is the city purchased this land for three million dollars in large part for um recreation and also housing we put a million dollars from the recreation fund into buying the land we went through a public process that said should have housing should have recreation we then said we're going to split the process up and uh, do separate tracks for reviewing each one. So we've we've been doing the housing. We've talked about that a lot, uh, and that's moving along on its path. This feasibility study that we did with the hub, that the it actually was only the first part of the feasibility that we did with the excuse me power wellness, basically said for their recommendation was we should focus on the country club road site because it has the most expansion opportunities. We, we obviously do have the 58 Berry Street and we should consider working with the hub to figure out a partnership. So uh, 
So my suggestion is that we complete the feasibility study, which is designed to give us a no go do, go no go decision before we do phase two, and then we do phase two. If we choose to develop something up there, then my further recommendation is that we then target the 55 Berry Street property to be redeveloped as shelter, housing, et cetera. Obviously, I think there's been some misunderstanding about, about that. I am not at all saying that we would do that until we have a new rec facility. I think some people misinterpret that. I was saying, do that immediately. No, that's our rec center. It will remain our rec center until we've made a decision and constructed something somewhere else. Uh, but that, as we just discussed, uh, issues of homelessness and the need is, are not going away and that might be a, a place that we could look at. Uh, we got an a architectural report that said it would be a solid building that could have transitional housing in it, could have a shelter space, could have a public facing bathroom. And uh, we ought to consider that. But in the meantime, I'm basically saying stay the course. Uh, let's work with the hub to see if we can find a way to lease or sell a portion of the land maybe for them to construct their building, but still keep our plans or not. But basically, um, that's where that's where we're at. And obviously, I know there are a lot of different opinions in the community. We've heard from a lot of different people, probably a lot of different opinions on the council. Uh, and we look forward to hearing the conversation and what you all have to say about it. Thanks, Bill. Um, I think one of the questions that is in some people's minds is, where would we be? How does doing the feasibility study, the phase one, uh, put us ahead of where we are now in terms of evaluating uh, the options? I don't know that it would give us different options. It would give us more information about this option. Uh, dig a little deeper into what programs might look at what what uh, those uh, what partners might be out there to, to support financially. I, I, I told the council I meant to the detail of those in. I put them on your desks to show we, we've done the first sort of 6,000 uh, public process of that, but we haven't done the remaining work in that. And then usually the way that works, if we say, okay, this just doesn't make sense, we stop then and then we go to some plan B or C. If we say, okay, it still makes enough sense to continue, then we go on to more site analysis, you know, rough plans, those kinds of things, and final cost estimates, and then again, decide if it's go, no go. It's meant to be modular. Um, and, you know, basically that's following the process that we outlined that we said we were going to do last year. So, um, but we don't have to do that. But that's that was the path that we went down, and I'm I'm saying we ought to continue down the path that is that we said we were going to do. But again, I'm I just work here. You guys make the decisions, so whatever you want to do is fine. Thanks, Bill. Just so the scope of work on the PC left on the desk. So the second part, that's assuming the city developed it. So that wouldn't apply if. We worked with the hub, or would it? Well, it would be there's a presumably there would be a some city part of this. Even if the hub were to do their bit, their tennis and the things they want to do, if this is going to be a recreation site, there's going to be some city role. We're going to be using all or some portion of the building for recreation facilities. Presumably, we'd have to build at least a new gym. You know, it might be a recommendation that we build this out. We don't try to build a whole huge facility at once that we try to do it incrementally within the, the funds we can do. I, I don't know. Um, that is an option. There's a lot of land up there. So that's one of the pluses of the site is there's a lot of opportunity to, you know, grow it out um, and look at, at different types of options. You know, we saw the Ballard King study, which, you know, I think we had some questions about, the assumptions of what we could get for revenues and those kind of things. And this would be kind of take that and try to tighten that up a little bit as well as, you know, what, what it might be a, a more Montpelier size facility. You know, do we need two pools and five gyms? And, you know, I don't know that we do, but 
do we need a gym or two? Maybe, you know, I mean, we have one gym on Barry Street. So if that's where we choose to go, then if if we're not interested in in doing anything up there or having the city do anything up there, rec, then we don't need to do anything else. I mean, that's, there's, you know, there's kind of a series of threshold decisions, right? If, if I tried to outline, you know, we, what do we do with 55 Barry street? If that's going to be our future rec, then just do that. If we're going to look around for other locations, we do that. Um, and then we have to get into, you know, property owner negotiations and those kinds of things. If we're going to, so the recommendation was consider, you know, keep looking at this site, build, you get more information. That is why we bought the site. So I'm just trying to be consistent with the messages we've given, but that's kind of my job is to keep implementing the policies that we've laid out. If, if you all uh, want to change our direction, that's kind of what this conversation is about. Is so it's changing direction. I think we're still trying to determine yeah. direction. Yeah. Well, that's what I mean. Yeah. Oh, so is this, the, is there still more presentation or are we in conversation? No, we're in conversation. Okay. I don't have any more presentation. Yeah. Um, I'm not running the meeting. So right. And to follow through, I think my take is that we have really large capital needs as a community and we've been talking about them a lot and still need to, and I guess we have a report coming soon to see how far in we are for water line, sewer lines, water plant, sewer plant, city hall, fire station, you know, fire trucks, um, possible rec center streets, sidewalks, it, it, there's just so many large and important things on this list. You know, I'll be curious to see what your tally is when you bring it in, Bill, but more than 150 million is 200 million. It, it's a lot. And and with that being said, I'm having a really hard time to say that this community is going to be in a position to invest a lot of capital in a recreation facility anytime soon. So having these conversations ahead of all those conversations seems off balance. Hmm. To me, um, and in terms of the rec, we had it seems that we've been presented with an opportunity by the hub to come in and potentially at least develop part of that area we've designed for recreation to get some recreation piece going that wouldn't be a capital investment on the part of the city of Montpelier potentially, which I find refreshing and something I want to hear about. Uh, so with that. I guess those are my concerns with, with, with the way we're approaching this. Um, Carrie. Thanks. Um, so I'm, I'm generally in favor of, of kind of sticking with our original plan and trying to do our feasibility studies, as we said we were going to do. However, when I look at the scope of work for completing phase one, the feasibility study, I'm not really clear on what we would get from that that we didn't get from the Ballard and King study. And um, so... I don't know if, if that's just something I'm misunderstanding. Um, but so if there's something really, some brand new information, then I think we should go ahead and finish phase one and then decide if we're going to continue on with this or not. Um, but I'm not convinced we're getting any new information. And then just the secondarily, the second part of what we're considering tonight is selling something to the hub. I'm really interested in the idea of having some recreation up there and having something um, happen sooner rather than later. Um, I'm not. I'm, I'm not necessarily convinced that we need to sell it below market rate in order to get that to happen. But um, you know, we can continue that conversation. But I think the first conversation is: Are we going to finish this feasibility study? Okay, can Karen. I just Go ahead, respond Bill. to that because it was a good question? You know, we can get. Uh, you don't necessarily have to decide all of this tonight either. So, I mean, we're trying to, we're coming into budget. So it seems, you know, we need to tee up these conversations so we can get more clarity on the report too. We'd be happy to get more information from that. We had, we got this, we had a long conversation with them, but it was a few months ago now. Um, and then we started, we were actually going to do the whole phase one. And then because of the near flood and everything else, we just did the, the city part. So, um, we can get some more clarity so that everyone's clear. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Adrian. Can you hear me? Oops. Yes, you, you kind of. Okay. Me. How about now? 
Oh, that's better. Okay. Yeah. We're, <laughs> Sorry. We're not used to not being able to hear you. I know. I am loud, but I am in a hotel room, so I apologize. Um, I did send an email to the council in case I had technical difficulties today, but it seems like everything is working for now. But I, I really wanted to, um, you know, I've we, we heard from Power Wellness. We have their feasibility review. You know, I think there are things that are missing from this study that will help us make informed, better informed decisions. Um, you know, when I think of recreation, I want to think holistically at our entire community. And according to that report, if, I mean, someone please correct me if I'm wrong, we looked at city owned assets, um, meaning buildings that the city owns. And so I would love to look beyond that in buildings that the city may not own, um, that are vacant, that might be an opportunity for recreation. Um, also partnering, partnering with our schools is an asset that we haven't had a huge success of partnering with. We have three beautiful school buildings in our town that we pay a lot of money for that we do not have access for, for recreation. Um, and we are a small town. We're a small region comparatively. And we need to think about sizing our recreation for the amount of people that live here. And we could really think outside the box. It does not have to be the Berry Street Building and or Country Club Road. I really want us as a city to think about what currently exists in our town that is considered recreation. So what is recreation? So really defining that. Um, what is missing that folks want? We have more, probably more studies than we need <laughs> to determine what folks want. Um, we have a lot of data. We have passionate people in our town that are experts in recreation. I don't think we need to do another feasible study. I think we just need to ask people what they want and they're going to tell us. Um, but the one thing they don't want is to pay for it. And so we're in a little bit of a bind here. But I think if we're very creative in terms of our partnerships, um, with, you know, buildings that we have that may be assets that we haven't looked at with recreation partners in our town that could help us think out outside the box, which I've already started to have these conversations to potentially bring in additional um, private, you know, recreation opportunities into some of our vac vacant buildings. I really think we can solve this problem without a huge budget without a, a burden on our taxpayers, if we collaborate and coordinate with the assets that we have in our community to solve this problem. And I would just encourage us not to think of a $7 million renovation to the Berry Street building when we could potentially, you know, use another building to put some basketball courts in that would not cost $7 million. I don't, have not done the study, I'm not a real estate expert, but I just want us to think a little bit differently about recreation and how we go about this and not corner ourselves into these two properties when we have other assets in our town that we could utilize and think creatively about recreation to solve this problem. And, and Adrian, not trying to put you on the spot or anything, but uh, do you have some thoughts yourself on what those other locations might be? So I drive past that empty building next to Bar Hill Gin or Bar Hill. I always call it Bar Hill Gin. Bar Hill by the co-op. It's an empty big warehouse. Um, I think it's a dirt floor inside. I don't know how much it would cost to put a floor down and some basketball courts. That is a brand new building that wouldn't need $7 million upgrades. Um, we have our three schools that we should absolutely consider an asset um, I know the rec department, you know, we've had many conversations about scheduling there, but I think we could figure it out. I really, really do. I think this is a problem that we could solve. Um, you know, we have vacant buildings in our town. Um, Rebel Rouser is vacant. Walgreens is going to be vacant. I know they can't probably accommodate basketball courts, but I think we just have to think a little bit differently about what we have instead of trying to build a shiny new building, which I love shiny new buildings, but we don't, our taxpayers do not have the appetite to bond for a new recreation department and do a $7 million renovation on Berry Street. But we do know 
that our community absolutely wants our children to be able to walk to recreation opportunities. Um, I've been in conversation with some of the churches. The churches are an opportunity for us to coordinate with. Um, they're in conversations with potential, you know, moving around of buildings and congregations and let's talk to them. They have classrooms, they have big open rooms. There could be offices, it could be childcare, it could be, you know, just different ways of thinking about what we already have and using our assets rather than trying to build something new. Thanks, Gary. Adrian, sorry. <laughs> um, not seeing any other council members' hands. Uh, so. um, oh, I'm sorry. Well, one yeah, I thank you. I had um, I had a follow up question for Adrian, and just a clarification: Are you suggesting that we that we purchase some additional properties, and then I would I don't know how it works. Could we lease a property? I don't know how we how we put recreation into somebody else's building. So it seems like we would have to buy we would have to buy it. Or did you have something else in mind? Could you lease a building so the city doesn't have it as an asset? I don't know the details of how that works, but I'm just trying to encourage us to think a little bit differently about this approach and be creative in our in our strategy mm -hmm. um, rather than just pitching hole in ourselves into these two buildings, which is what Power Wellness has done and what we've been discussing. I don't know all the answers, but I'm just, I would propose us to just think about and explore different ways of of working within our city limits and and really the money that we don't have to to increase recreation opportunities for everyone from zero to a hundred plus that have, you know, they're that's accessible. To all. Thanks. So, um, I, I I really kind of agree with what uh, Tim was saying. I, I I just don't see a path to a new structure at the moment. I mean, I, I look at the Colchester experience, which uh, they they just broke ground on a new um, sixteen million dollar uh, two story thirty thousand square foot uh, rec center. The process for them started in 2002. They're paying for it with um, local option tax, sales tax. So, you no, know, they're bonding for that, but the bond is going to be paid with the sales sales tax option tax. So, I mean, it was a process that took them a long time. They backtracked and started over a couple of times. Um, and I imagine, um, I think the cost of the actual building is something like eleven eleven million dollars, and then there's site development, and so on. Um, I, I also agree that I've heard from a lot of people in town who 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 use the existing rec center and and whose kids use the existing rec center and 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 like the fact that it's downtown despite the shortcomings uh, for parking and that sort of thing. Um, I think Power Wellness got got their evaluation of that building wrong. They said it it wasn't really worth any attention and that it doesn't do anything well. And that to me, I mean, we have two two studies, Breadloaf and GBA, that says this it's a perfectly fine building. It needs upgrade. It it has a lot of deferred maintenance and outdated systems. The seven million dollar bill is the Cadillac. That includes, you know, solar on the roof and complete air source heat pumps and stuff. The basic, even the updated numbers from May, the basic plan is still around four million. And I believe we have a grant, a DOE grant that's going to replace a million and a half of that with a new heating system and what an electrical service. I don't think it's the electrical wiring but uh anyway we so that that takes it down to what two and a half so it's it's not it's it's a chunk of change um we need to that 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 figure includes an elevators make it ada compliant um new surface on the basketball court equipment in the basement or wherever we want to put it for fitness i mean we we can essentially create uh, a new health center, a new uh, rec center in that 
existing building for a lot less than what um, we would need to do for a new facility. Um, and we also have all these other potential uh, bonding needs. We're going to be talking about Isabel. We've got a, a report tonight on the treatment plant that in East State Street's probably going to go over budget. I mean, School Street did. East State Street will probably go over. Um, so there's a lot of stuff coming up. It seems to me that, plus, no matter what we do, we're going to have to use that building, as you said at the beginning of the meeting, Bill. We're going to need that building for several years. So we've got to do something to make it a little more workable. We've already started uh, taking out the haz hazardous materials. We're, we're making improvements already. We're sort of committed to that building. Um, I think that's where we that's where we ought to focus. And I think if we if we do make that decision, a lot of other things fall into place. Thanks, Sal. Um, Carrie, your hands down. Uh Arnie, I think I'm going to call on you, if that's okay. Um, you know, because it's your department, and uh, okay. and uh, and the manager has pointed out there are a lot of members of the recreation board here. Um, can I have them come up and maybe yeah, they would like to speak? Absolutely, yeah. And that they're come on up, Chris, Heather, and Peter. You know, because you're you're in the business of running our current rec system and planning for future needs, and so I'm in, interested in hearing what you have to say, and I'll I'll have have you all introduce yourselves too. Just uh, share the mic, yeah. Hi, my name is Chris Hancock. I've been on the uh, rec board for something like five years, I think. Um, and uh, that's all i got to say for the moment. Okay. Uh, my name is Heather Bailey, and I'm also on the rec board as a volunteer, and I also volunteer in the office. <laughs> um, Peter Cohn, also a member of the rec board um, and also a parent of the children that use rec facilities in the area. And I'm Arnie McMullen, Director of Recreation for the City of Montpelier. And how do you think we should be thinking about planning for this need that is not fully met at the present time? I mean, obviously there's challenges within the city financially. I mean, this is my... Uh, probably my fourth attempt at a recreation facility, and it always comes down to dollars. Tim, I think, was on the committee when it was the facilities committee almost 30 years ago, and they said the recreation wall in the back of the gym was terrible back then and didn't know how long that might last. So still standing, so I guess we're we're alive. But um, part, of, part of what I do and what I try to think about is, you know, when we're thinking recreation, we got to think the next 50 to 100 years into the future. We can't be thinking about, you know, immediately tomorrow, this, that, you know, because we're going to make some pretty rash decisions that may end up impacting what could have been a really wonderful situation. Um, part of what we do is also is the thought is we also as a community center, we're also looking at all ages, which would include the seniors of the community to be able to use this facility. And, you know, some of you may have heard what I'm hoping for, but part of my thoughts was, uh, you know, having a couple of basketball courts at least and an indoor walking track and probably a, a turf space, you know, but also could all be built in phases. Um, you could put $4 million maybe into the rec center thinking that, well, that's great. We put $4 million into it. But what if we put $4 million into another facility that it could actually generate revenue? Because a current rec center is not going to generate back a whole lot of revenue to make back what you put in a bond payment. You know, So one of the things that was nice about the Ballard and King study was he showed a, fe a feasibility study, and that was based on a, a large space. 
we just needed a starting point and that's where we started. But that can all be scaled down to the size of the community to make it something that, um, you know, fits this area and reduce the size considerably as far as the size of the actual space. Um, and being that it's a, uh, we're probably looking at more of a, for lack of a better term, um, you know, a field house type building, which is a pretty open space. I don't anticipate that being a huge, huge cost compared to a brick and mortar building, um, you know, to put together. And I think there's a lot of, lot of opportunity because not only would you have the option of indoor recreation, which we're suffering from immensely in this city, um, people can't really, you know, a lot of seniors can't walk outdoors. Um, in the wintertime, if they fall on a sidewalk and break a hip, you know, that that's down a very bad course. Um, <clears throat> if you want to, if you want an opportunity to really start bringing people to a community to come here, visit, spend money, stay in hotels. If we have a facility that has a couple of gyms, we can run AAU tournaments. We can run um, the mini metros you know, on the weekends, we could do youth basketball for all of central Vermont and we would charge all the fees and, and bring people to participate in our programs. I mean, as they say in recreation, the opportunities are endless, but you do have to have a starting point. And, you know, a lot of our recreation facilities are aging. So down the road, you know, you got, a, you got a swimming pool that was built in 1939. You know, at what point do we have to start thinking about where we're going with that um, and other structures that are challenged? But if you want an opportunity to grow recreation, and I would believe that would help bring people to the community is to have a facility that is going to draw people. When I used to answer the phones a lot years ago, the first two questions I used to get is, what's the school system like and what are the recreation opportunities? And those were used to be the most popular questions I used to get when I answered the phone with people wanting to move to Montpelier. So. And know. where do you think we are vis-a-vis -vis the uh, phase one of the feasibility study? Um, I think, I think phase one, you know, gave us, uh, you know, some, a, an idea from a outside source that says that, you know, this country club road, property is a really valuable asset. It has the potential not only to do indoor recreation, but also to do a lot of outdoor recreation. And plus people have a facility where they can come in and warm up and then go out cross country skiing or whatever. Um, but it has the potential of, and this is, was also part of the study is that adding on to space. So someday you might want to put an indoor pool if things show ex things are really successful People are coming to the community, they're using the space, you're generating some revenue. Next step might be to look at an indoor swimming pool for that space or another type of attachment. But I know a lot of people over the years, I can't tell you how many exactly, but have gone to St. Albans to that sports facility to play indoor soccer late at night with their kids. You know, it would be nice if we had something in central Vermont that people didn't have to travel 45 minutes or go to Rutland, you know, to do sports. So, but I think it's an opportunity. And right now, the one asset we have is we own the property. So we don't have to go buy another building or buy another property. We have a starting point and it's, you know, what what y'all decide is the best way to go. But I, I just think for potential, that's the best option for recreation for the future. Thanks, Arnie. Do you folks have anything to add? Don't don't fight it. Don't you first. Okay, these are half form thoughts uh, in the sense that it, it it's it's uh, it's great to actually hear the city council thinking this through. Um, I, I'm really glad to hear recreation on the agenda, um, and uh, I I do hear the discussion in in in, in, in at two levels. One is how can we address immediate needs? And there's talk possibility of doing something on Barry Street or the possibility of making better use of other buildings in town. 
I'm actually interested in following up uh, with both of you who are talking about that, uh, about those options, because uh, we do need to do something uh, for the short term. Um, I also think we should not lose sight of the long term because um, our facilities for recreation and what we can put into recreation as a, as a town uh, does really uh, bring long-term benefits uh, to the well-being of the people who live here and to our ability to um, attract more people. Um, it, it does seem to me that a solution to many of our problems would be to attract more people. Um, so uh, I, I look forward to talking more with you folks in the future about what recreation means to us as a community. And during this very hard time financially and with uh, so many uh, pressing needs in the city, what I'm just hoping is that we can keep a strand of process going on the long term, that we don't uh, uh, prematurely throw away the options that we're trying to develop, understanding that the money that it's going to take to develop some of those longer term options uh, may take a long time to put together. But let's not uh, give up on that would be my suggestion. Thanks. I think we must be the only state capital that doesn't have a community center. And I really think that we need to move forward with this and, and um, build something for the future. And the, the facility we have now, it, it, great, it's centrally located, but you can only do one activity at a time. You can play basketball, you can play pickleball. You cannot change the blueprint of the building. I mean, it's that's you can't extend it in any direction. And for example, the, the pickleball court and the basketball, there's no there's no room in the in the back once past the line. You're you're stuck there. So um, I just think that this facility that we have in Country Club Road is incredible. And the space that you're thinking about selling is flat. And that's where we have a lot of our recreation games going on, soccer in the fall, for example. And I just think something, if you sell to an exclusive group like this that has Tennis, it, it doesn't serve our whole community. And I think that's what we need to really think about. Thanks. Um, I, I don't want to repeat any of the points, but I think one the one thing that concerns me is even with a renovation of the current facilities, um, you can't expand the space out much. You, there's no room for spectators in the current gym, no no room, as, as Heather said, to have multiple either games of basketball or multiple things going on at the same time. I understand that it will open up more space downstairs, upstairs, but at the same time, it's not the type of space where you can have sports that require lots of height, lots of kind of distance for many things to go on. Um, I'm also concerned about trying to utilize the schools. I think it would makes a lot of sense to partner up with the schools more um, and to maximize what we can, but they are already extremely limited with space. Um, I know particularly in the winter and then into spring, they're starting practices at the high school at eight o'clock and later. And so I don't think that it's accurate to say that there that space exists. I think they are also looking for more space and would benefit from a larger facilities that we could potentially provide. Um, and then same with looking for other spaces in the short term might work, but I think the goal should be to consolidate everything so that we can have things where multiple family members can be doing things at the same time in the same facility. And I think that just makes it makes it easier for, for many reasons. Um, and then the accessibility part in terms of distance, I do understand concerns, but from everything I've experienced with my own family, the majority of the people are driving to these facilities anyway. Um, there is a benefit of kids being able to walk after school and things like that, but I, I personally don't feel that that kind of outweighs the benefits of having a larger facility where multiple things go on. And we could work with the schools to provide busing out there or other transportation options to make it easier and, and more feasible. Thanks. Council members have any questions before we let them go? 
All right. Thanks. Great. Thank you. All right. I see some people who've had their hands raised patiently for some time, uh, starting with Stan. Uh, thanks, Jack. And, and luckily, the button holds itself down, so you don't need to hold your hand up. Um, I I appreciate this conversation. I, I think recreation in Montpelier is important. Um, just kind of touching on a couple of different topics, you know, all together. I I think there's current recreational facilities we have that um, maybe haven't received a full investment. Um, we've got uh, the bike path, which is becoming harder to use and, and maintenance there. Um, that potentially uh, we need to make that that resource available again to, to folks in town. Um, I don't know enough about the Barry Street facility and, and Country Club, but I do, uh, I think back to Tim's point, I do find the appeal of putting the risk on the shoulders of a private developer. Um, you know, I, I think looking at the option of what that could look like should be something we, we entertain. Are there ways we can ask them to provide certain sports or, or such? Um, conversely, that property seems like it's going to be very valuable in a couple of years. I don't know that that price is uh, <laughs> is a fair price at this point. Um, but I, I would love for the council to entertain private partnerships, uh, public-private partnerships, as Adrian brought up. Um, I do think, for example, uh, there's a lot on Stonecutter's Way that's available that could potentially be a more localized expansion of, of uh, 55 Berry Street. Um, having local walkable resources is a benefit. Uh, I think old folks are going to struggle to drive up to Country Club. Um, so I, I, I like the, the conversation about flexibility in town. I like the conversation about partnering with private entities like the Hub and would love to see us explore that. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Tori? Thinking um, really concretely about the earlier question about whether to sell the building and five acres of land to a private company, I just want to point out, um, since I don't think it's been mentioned yet, there are people living there. Um, there are a significant number of vulnerable people for whom their only shelter in the winter is the Elks Club property. Um, and right now we're talking about it is so that building could go away without a backup plan. Um, if there were a serious um, concrete plan for there's going to be a shelter for unhoused people in town, and we're going to since we're going to seriously do some work on making housing affordable here for people. Um, I think that might be a whole different question. But for, you know, for, for right now to sell that building is basically selling people's home out from under them. Um, we've already chased people away from camping up there. Um, we can't take their shelter away um, without, without some kind of really good alternate plan. Um, I, I'm also just going to say I raised my family with a very old-fashioned idea that there's a difference between needs and wants. Um, and even though it may not be fun to think mostly in terms of what is needed and sharing until everybody in the community has what they need before we go for what we want, I still think that's an important traditional value. Thanks. Thank uh, Jody. Hi, thank you. Um, one of the members of your- you Just uh, mention your name, please. Oh, uh, Jody Pedersen, Freedom Drive. Um, one of the things that one of the young men mentioned from the committee, the rec committee, was the, bringing more people into Montpelier. So I'm asking you, where are those people that are going to come? Where are they going to live if we don't um, get our act together and get the housing built? I'm very much against selling that prime area that's flat, that has that building on it to the hub until we ab absolutely know that we can build in those other areas on, on that property. Because if it ends up that the only place we could build, we can, and that's where we could build big, taller apartment buildings, that kind of thing. Um, and I, I do have some comments that from someone who wasn't able to come, uh, the Messings, Bob and 
Deb Messing. Um, they would like to encourage everyone not to vote to sell this parcel tonight and to that, that it's and they agree with me i had said that it's it's seems elitist to send to to be building indoor tennis courts up there before we've even got anything else going up there if it's it doesn't seem like the right thing to start with and it's if we rem it, they said if we remember correctly this would essentially be a private or perhaps semi private entity and would entail membership dues and this it it might be very unaffordable for many residents of the community and they feel that it would send the wrong message to our community which has envisioned this development as inclusive multi generational and mixed income and the first commitment we would be making is for a private tennis club with some other recreational aspects. So I'm against selling to the hub at this point in time. And I, I'd like to know more about what you know about the, how, how the, how the rest of the property is for building. Have we got any of that information back, but that's a different conversation I know, but thank you. Thanks, Jody. I can just tell you, there is a lot of information on the city's web page. There's one one of the whole uh, sections of the of the page has to do with uh, with the Country Club Road property, and so we're we're not at the point of building building anything yet or close to it. But we're uh, we keep moving forward, and and there is information. To see there, obviously, engineering studies haven't haven't been done yet, and that's uh, that's part of the issue. Um, uh, iPad two, Steve. Hello, uh, Mr. Mayor, City Council. Can you hear me? Yes. If you could try to keep your voice up, that would be helpful. Oh, um, is this better? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm Steve Cease. I'm um, calling in from North Street. I think this has been a, a really interesting and useful conversation. I would like to um, try to go back to maybe a little bit more of a, of a big picture and try to remember, in my mind at least, who our principal uh, priorities should be directed to in terms of our occasion, and that's the kids. Uh, people have talked about how important it is for children to walk to a, a recreation center after school or on a weekend. I totally agree with that. And as a, as a sort of a subjective point, I think that having kids walking to a recreation center in the afternoon or on a weekend adds a really nice sense of community and involvement to the town. But be that as it may, I think um, it's we're really pursuing a fantasy if we're talking about building a, a huge multi-million dollar recreation facility at the country club. Theoretically and conceptually, there are an enormous number of reasons why it sounds great. But practically speaking, we are facing such an astonishing number of, of uh, uh, debt needs, debt, potential debt obligations that I just don't think it's realistic to continue to uh, pursue the, the uh, country club project. I do think it makes sense to continue to investigate and um, hopefully um, do, do take steps to improve the Barry Street facility. The, um, you know, and I'd also like to say in terms of recreation that actually we're living in Vermont, which is one of the greatest recreation states in the country. And it seems to me that we really need to be doing more if, 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 if we're not already to market our opportunities for gravel biking, for road biking, for mountain biking, cross country skiing, hiking, um, nature, uh, nature walks, we have one of the best municipal parks imaginable up at Hubbard Park, and I really think we should be we should be thinking about outdoor recreation as much as we're thinking about indoor recreation. Um, I think that's about what I've got to say. So thanks for the opportunity and uh, good luck. Oh, one last thing: I do think that um, it makes sense to explore a partnership with the hub. I think that the kind of facilities they're talking about constructing, big buildings, probably would have no there would be no place for those kinds of structures in this in the downtown it makes sense to me to to talk to them um, and to explore 
opportunities for for favorable um, for favorable approval treatment for kids and Montpelier rights in their in their facilities. And I do believe they're open to those kinds of discussions. So thanks very much and good luck. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Christine. Christine Lillyquist, are you attempting to unmute yourself? Okay, we'll pass over you for the time being. Um, Steve and Nat, do you want to come up? The table are up here. Well, whatever is comfortable for you. Sitting a long time. Hi, I'm Steve Ribellini. I know uh, a lot of you in this room, but certainly not everyone. Um, what I wanted to say on this, uh, I was the one that had... Uh, well, I was involved in the sale of the country club. I was in a partnership, City Properties, LLC, and I was the principal that negotiated that sale with the city. Um, before that sale, I'd been working with the hub to try to do something up there uh, for a year or two before that. We talked about different uh, phases. Um, at one point, we had heard that if the city took it, then they wouldn't be doubling up on some things, some of the recreation things. And perhaps they could do a public-private partnership that would be beneficial. Um, so how I got to where I was with the offer, I had heard unofficially uh, back this spring, which is really rumor mill on the street, that the existing Elks building uh, maybe either uh, uh, sold or uh, raised, torn down, not to stand in the path of progress. So I uh, came in and met with uh, with Bill and said, well, perhaps I'd be interested in buying it. And uh, I also own an adjacent uh, piece of land uh, next to the Elks of about seven acres, and uh, which I had looked at uh, uh, building uh, uh, six housing units on that, um, and and for people who aren't familiar with it, that uh, that parcel is essentially across the driveway and parking lot from the building. Across the parking lot, correct. Okay. And uh, so I said, perhaps we could do a, um, a swap on the land and do a subdivision that way, uh, divide it off. Uh, so. You know, I had this plan to uh, use it, the existing building, partially for the hub, and then the, uh, and hoping to attract to the building, say, a daycare, maybe bigger than the one we had there previously. Other uses could be, you know, office space or meeting rooms, maybe a small grocery store in up there. Um, maybe not right away, but at some point to help serve the housing community that will be built there at some uh, time in the future. Um, we had said perhaps uh, four to five acres of land, which is really to the south of the building and some behind it. Um, the area to the south is where that dirt parking lot is. So people are looking at this on the screen the parcel that's labeled Blueberry Associates right. LLC is what we're talking about. Right, right. And, uh, which actually was part of the Elks building property before I owned it. Um, that lot had been sold off separately, and at some point I acquired a partial interest in it. Um, so like I say, even if, we, uh, if the city sold some land, there'd still be of the 12 acres that were set aside for recreation, there'd still be eight or nine acres. The um, uh, the other thing with the land swap, um, it's possible that an egress could be made from the parking lot of Country Club down over that seven acres, back on the Country Club property, 
and come out on what I call Berry Street Extension. And um, that would have to be investigated. But I think that option might be less than some others I've heard, which I don't think have even been priced yet, perhaps, up through Sabin's Pasture or up onto Town Hill Road somewhere. Um, the, the other thing is um, this would put the property or the building and the land back onto the tax roll, and it would show positive signs of developing happening. I, you know, and I think this would be good for Montpelier and benefit not only Montpelier, but the community. Um, you know, we weren't going to, uh, as I expressed, uh, we weren't going to buy the parking lot. Um, all right, so we save that could be used for um, other buildings that may be built to the left of this building someday. Uh, and we may even develop uh, up to 50 spaces on the land we would acquire. Um, it, it uh, you know, some people have asked, well, why, why did I offer that price? Well, that's what real estate sales are. They're negotiations. They're an offers made, and it's either counter offered or rejected or talked about. Um, you know, the building uh, is going to need substantial fit up. We're going to have to put in to to make all these uses work. Um, and you know, when we sold it, it had a a pretty good uh, rental income. And we really only had the elk space, the 6,000 square feet vacant. Um, and commercial properties are bought and sold on the numbers. That is, that's one va uh, you know, way to value a building. What, what, you know, um, what's the profit and loss? Um, you know, we had renovated that building quite a lot um, when the elk's downsized. And we renovated about 9,000 feet of it. It's a 15,000 square foot building, and we had it up and leased in about 18 months. Um, you know, the, the whole space up there, um, it's, there's a lot of acres. It's a big sandbox. We can all play there. So I've, uh, you know, been a, kicking around my paper for 76 years, and uh, I just think perhaps this could be uh, – Good for the city and good for the community. Thank you. Thanks. Steve. Oh, you first. Yeah. So I'm Todd Olson. I'm a resident of Middlesex and I'm a, maybe a new face here, but I'm one of the original uh, members of participants in the group uh, we all know as the hub. Um, I want to give you a little bit of context uh, that might might uh, you may already know, but I feel it's important because when I hear the word uh, public-private partnership, it sort of gives me the impression that we're kind of part of the recreational industrial complex, and this is not this is so far from the truth. We are we really started as a community of of tennis members who came together, of tennis players who came together after the purchase of First and Fitness by. Um, uh, GMCF. And when the potential arose that we were going to lose our indoor tennis courts. And, um, you know, we sort of think of that as not just a, a loss of recreational opportunity, but the loss of a community. Um, when First and Fitness was at its peak, it had about 200 plus tennis members. It hosted uh, USDA league matches when at which point the lounge was converted into a potluck venue. Um, it had Friday night doubles mixers. It hosted a thriving junior program of middle school, well, elementary through high school students. It also was a practice space for the U32 tennis team and the Montpelier tennis team during the early spring before they could get outside. And I think it even hosted a couple of state finals when uh, the, the dates were rained out outside. Um, so for the last four years or so, all of those opportunities have been lost. And now the potential for losing tennis is about to become a reality. Um, the last indoor tennis court, which we've been clinging to for about three years, is going to be repurposed after this winter, uh, at which point there will be no indoor tennis um, within a 40-minute drive of the state capitol. 
So, um, uh, so, you know, we are not a for-profit group. We are a group of tennis players of members of the community. Um, if, uh, I don't think any of us really have a lot of experience in, in business. Uh, we just want to see, we don't want to see us see the community lose the opportunity to play tennis in the winter and lose the opportunity to serve the the kids who want to, I mean, tennis is an aging sport right now in Montpelier, largely because kids don't have an opportunity to play really. Uh, I believe the, the Montpelier boys tennis team is no longer. Um, and part of that is a function of the fact that we have no junior tennis program. There's no, there's no just easy way for kids to get into tennis. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what, um, uh, we hope to do if um, the sale goes through to Blueberry Associates. Um, we would want to uh, to buy or lease a portion of the clubhouse building up there. Um, and uh, most likely we would lease a portion of the space to a restaurant um, that might also be a, a music venue. Uh, we at some point in the distant past had talked with um, with three penny tap room about the space, they had expressed an interest. They have since uh, expanded in town. Uh, so that's not likely, but I think it's a very appealing space, especially given the city's plans to uh, to build housing there, a very appealing space for, for a restaurant. Um, and the, the, the rest of the space would be a virtual sports venue. Um, for those who don't know what virtual sports are, um, a simulated screen that allows people to basically do exactly what they do outdoors indoors with regular sports equipment and a ball so for instance uh for golfers you can go in there with your clubs and 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 balls there's a projection on the screen that simulates golf courses around the world you hit your actual clubs with a ball into the screen the the computer picks up the trajectory and envisions where it goes on the screen. The view changes to where your ball lands and you can play 18 holes that way. Um, and it's a similar situation for baseball and for soccer. Um, you know, it's a space that would be available to, you know, to um, high school kids playing both of those sports. Um, and uh, the rest of the building could still be available uh, to the city for community space possibly daycare. Um, our goal is to build to the, I guess it's the east of the um, of the, the existing building, a sports barn that we would hope would encompass uh, space for four tennis courts. Um, also space that could double as pickleball courts, a soccer training space, and possibly concerts and special events. Um, you know, most likely this would have to be phased in with a sort of two court facility to start um, and and then hopefully expanded. Uh, there's also potential for outdoor pickleball, um, uh, for paddle tennis and uh, other sports and family activities as well. Um, it would be a membership model. I mean, the the structure is expensive to build. Tennis is not a big money making sport, which is why uh, Nick Pedersen, as soon as he bought First and Fitness, started to repurpose the tennis courts for other other purposes, where you can pack more people onto uh, onto the space. So, um, in reality, the idea for virtual sports actually came up as a way of of funding a tennis barn um, because it's a, you know, it, it is potentially lucrative in a way that could help support uh, the tennis facility. Um, so anyway, we see this as a win-win for the city, the hub and Montpelier area and, and you know, to uh, address the concerns of the, the recreational group. Um, there are 12 acres here. And I believe we're only talking about, uh, two or three for the sports barn. Um, so there is still ample land um, for any future plans the city would have <clears throat> for recreation there. Um, the building itself, I don't think is really convertible to basketball courts per se. I don't think the, you know, the ceilings are not very high. So I don't think it's really usable for the, you know, some of the core things that the city wants out of, out of recreation to begin with. 
Um, so we see this as kind of as um, something that could potentially become the seed of a wonderful recreational complex up there if the city finds a way to eventually fund building up there. Um, um, that's our pitch. Thanks, Todd. Thanks Todd, when you said the building isn't, the roof isn't that high, you mean that the the tennis barn isn't high enough for no, uh, no, basketball I, I mean the, the existing or you mean the current structure. Building? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the recreational group, you know, seemed really worried that you were giving away, you know, uh, that you would be selling away, you know, property that's, you know, that's valuable for their recreational purposes. And, you know, I think the building is really more about sort of community space. You know, it's ideal for a restaurant. A lot of those facilities are already there you know, virtual sports can happen in a relatively small space, but I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it would be functional for, you know, larger recreational purposes. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's, I think what we want to do up there is really actually very consistent with the, with what, you know, the city's needs are. Okay. Any questions? Mr. Palin. Well, um, the presentation, uh, I think the idea is a good example of how a city can create collaboration with nonprofits. Um, my question will be about membership. So if it will be a kind of a community center and all our town can uh, benefit from it, I want to see some kind of public hours or city passes, something like that. So you mentioned about membership, but how are you planning to st structure that membership? So there will be like different levels of membership. So yeah. all the our community members can be a member or what are, what are your plans? I mean, that's, those are details that still have to be worked out. I mean, it, it's um, like I said, the numbers I think are hard to make work. And, and uh, just because it's such a big space, it'll be an expensive process to build the, you know, to build the structure. We would hope to have a, I, I would, I think a tiered membership, um, structure where there would be opportunities for lower income people to, you know, to, uh, to get memberships there. Maybe it's something that we could continue having discussions with the city about that, uh, that there might be, you know, funds in the recreational, uh, fund to, you know, to help fund those, those memberships. Um, uh, there may well be grant money out there too, to, you know, to, um, to help fund them. So it's important to us that it be accessible to, you know, to, to many groups of people. Yeah. So another question uh, came to my mind after listening to you. I know we are all community members that you're not coming from other space or anything. So that's why we can understand each other. So uh, is it possible to put something if we decided to go with this plan? Oh, like first three years, HUB will provide support the community that community members can benefit from something like that. So then uh, we can sit down and create ideas how community can use that uh, facilities. Just just the brainstorming, so I'm not yeah. trying to you know, uh, throw anything at you, but the general question, is there any possibility doing that? I mean, or will you be like I, open or I don't know. I, we, I'm trying to. We are to... absolutely open. I, yeah. I would say that the difficulty for us is actually going to be in the, in the, the early years. Like that's when it's going to be hardest to make the numbers work for, for this facility. Um, you know, uh, as we build membership, it will get easier. So I would almost turn that around and say, I wonder if the city could, you know, could be of help to the project at the beginning. I realized that the, that funds are very limited, but we'd be talking about something way more limited than, you know, than building a facility up there or renovating a, you know, a, um, a facility in town. Thank you, because some people were talking about, oh, it will be kind of elitist. Yeah. Uh, that's why I was trying to learn, will it be like that or not? Right. Uh, again, you know, we haven't decided anything, but just maybe it might be kind of a, sound like a details for most of the people. I think it is important to discuss things before deciding to anything, because there must be some kind of 
low um, time for all the facilities. So there should be something we can create for public access, city pass, like public art, something we can do. Right. I think it doesn't have to be, oh, people will come and use the facilities for nothing, like 24 hours. But I don't know, a couple hours during the weekend when families can come and like they can have something at the restaurant, right? Walk around and their kids can use or they can use as a family. Again, just a, like a brainstorming uh, because in the end, everybody wants to make this as a community-based uh, yeah. facility. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Pam. Absolutely. And in answer to your question, anything we can imagine any, anything we can imagine asking for, we can ask for. I mean, whether they agree to it or not is another matter. I've got a yeah. couple of hands up on the screen, Tim. And I'll get to you, Carrie. Thanks. Yeah, I um, I I I remember that we've we've had lots of discussions about this in the past, and not every member of city council was part of those discussions. So it is worth kind of you know. Pulling that out, looking at it again, um, the kind of questions that Palin was asking are questions that we asked before. And um, uh, I think, you know, so I, I don't want to try to summarize everything from the past now, but I'll just say that I'm I'm not interested in a public-private partnership with the hub. Um, I'm interested in maybe selling them some land so that they can do what they want to do. But the but indoor tennis courts don't meet the recreational needs of the city. We've done multiple studies and surveys and tennis courts of any kind are way down the list of people's priorities for what they want in recreation. And indoor tennis courts are, you know, not even really coming up. Um, so, so I don't think that there's a compelling public interest to build indoor tennis courts such that we would sell it for less than it's worth, such that we would sacrifice our future possible use of the property. Um, so all those things, I'm, I'm not really interested in, in compromising all of that stuff, but it's a, it's a big piece of property up there. There may be a spot that could be carved off and sold to a private enterprise that wants to do whatever they want, including build indoor tennis courts, which I'm sure some people would love and it would be great to have. And it would be great to have the, the property back on the tax rolls. I'm all for that. Um, but I don't want, I don't want to, uh, the, I don't even know what the private partnership means exactly and what it would mean in this case. And I'm, I don't feel convinced that this would warrant something like that. So I would like to keep the conversation to, can we, are we interested in selling part of it? And then, and then key to that is, are we ready to let go of that building? Because the last, the, the last study that we had recommend using that building, saying it was actually in good shape and we're going to do some recreation up there, then we might want to not completely raise the building and start over again. So we don't know about that yet. So I think that those are some of the questions that have to be answered. Thanks, Carrie. Could I speak, speak to that? Um, yeah, I'll let you answer that question, but, but keep it kind of short because you're kind of jumping the queue. Um, <clears throat> And, and introduce yeah. yourself. <laughs> the uh, Matt, use of the... Would you please introduce yourself? Sorry. Not Matt... really knows you. Oh, boy. <clears throat> and Nat Winthrop, uh, co-chair of the Hub. Um, the current building that Steve Ribellini has uh, put an offer up to buy, uh, to the extent the Hub uses that, and remember, it could also be used by the city, it could also be used uh, for daycare, uh, but the part that the hub use would be open to the public uh, community space that includes virtual sports and a, and a restaurant. Uh, it would not be exclusive in any way. So in terms of the sports barn and the tennis piece, that would be on two to three acres adjacent and would be totally privately funded uh, and would leave at least 15 acres uh, out of the, no, I'm sorry, uh, nine acres uh, for the area that uh, has been designated in the master plan for recreation. Um, so I don't think it's inconsistent with 
your concerns, uh, Carrie. Thanks, Nat. Uh, Adrian. Um, I just wanted to just learn a little bit more about the sports barn. Um, I think I heard this correctly, but I just wanted to confirm that you said that it was only going to be tennis courts because there are barns that are out there that are modularly based that you could have tennis courts with basketball courts and pickleball to satisfy, you know, more inclusive needs of our community that I don't think would be too cost prohibitive. Um, so I was just wondering if, if I heard that correctly and if you'd be open to that mix used to just widen up your audience a little bit more to be more inclusive of the needs of Montpelier. I think we're about to get an answer to that. Yeah, I think I think that's absolutely possible in a, a structure big enough for a four court, you know, the, a four court size uh, barn. Uh, there's no question if we have to, for financial reasons, start with a, a two court structure that becomes difficult. Um, and you know there there are pros and cons to to each of them. Obviously, the the cost of building a two court structure is much lower. Uh, it becomes harder to, however, to as you say to 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 appeal to a wider um, you know range of people because you just don't have the space. Um, so that that's a decision that's still that's kind of that's still down the road. But absolutely, if there's a if there's a four court um, structure there. It could be it could be repurposed, and I know that that uh, the capital soccer for one is right now uh, sandwiched into just two courts on uh, at, at GMCF um, during the winter, and they would um, they would love to have a have a bigger space to to practice in. Thanks, Todd. Uh, Mary. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Um, well, just very briefly, um, Mary, mm -hmm. uh, Messier from Luma Street. Um, I don't think this is something that should be voted on and decided really quickly. I agree with some other people who are saying, look at look at options. And also uh, would agree with Tori. Uh, she spoke to the value of looking at needs versus wants. Uh, what is really needed? There's many people struggling, many elders struggling with with cost. Um, would there be transportation to such a place um, that's public transportation? Because it seems like we don't have good public transportation in, in many ways. We, we have it. I appreciate it. I use it. But um, also, there should be bus service to any of these um places that that people can recreate because not everyone can own a car or wants to own a car um what are the um thoughts about membership costs you know there's just so many questions about this that i think it's really logical not to jump into something like this um and to think a lot further on this thank you thanks mary Hi, my name is Mike Vitti. I live on Berlin Street, and uh, I appreciated the rec group sitting up here at the table today. Um, I'm hoping that they can be more vocal as uh, this process moves forward. We know it's been a long, long time coming, getting these reports together, getting the information. Um, the Country Club Road property, I believe, was purchased as an investment to make a vibrant future for our community. And uh, these large open parcels that are not in floodplains are almost non-existent in the city now. And um, while some some community services and recreation can be provided in downtown spaces. Not all of them can. Um, selling this prime portion of property isn't going to solve our budget issues. It's just not. Um, that's my take. Sorry. Um, I challenge those that think that renovating the existing Barry Street facility is a viable option. I have spent countless hours in the basement of that building while people are just walking up and down the courts and it is challenging. So to have different events going on on different floors, uh, while people will call it a planned victory, you have people working out, people doing yoga, people running. It's uh, It seems like a, a tall task to make that happen. Um, we've heard estimates of five or so million dollars, six million dollars to renovate that space, not including grants that uh, Councillor Alfano mentioned. But we've also heard that a new facility could be constructed at Country Club Road for roughly the same price. 
give or take some here. It's just something to help put this all in context. Um, that facility on Barry Street has far outlived its life pretending to be a rec center. And while it could continue to serve the community in some way, recreation, I think, has changed um, in terms of what community needs are and sports activity recreation. Um, it seems short-sighted to sell the most easily and accessible and developable portion of Country Club Road to the first unsolicited opportunity that has approached the city. Um, I appreciate their need for a space. I understand that the uh, Green Mountain Fitness is closing their courts, but it um, I feel like there could potentially be more diverse opportunities there in terms of space and services provided. Um, they mentioned the need for more indoor soccer courts, uh, you know, baseball needs places to play, but not everyone can play on the same surface. And it's challenging to flip flop those on a quick need to need basis. Um, so I would argue that um, there should be more information gathered before we just assume people will want to play in a certain type of building. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Steve, come on up. Hi, my name is Heidi Arias. I'm the assistant rec director, and I just want to some something briefly. Um, I wish this we just finished our soccer season, and I just wish if you guys would have seen, we had over a hundred kids in just the pre-K to second grade using our soccer fields up at Country Club. Not one person complained about driving. Lots of those families had multiple kids that had to go to Dog River and had to go to other towns to play soccer. And they loved that space. Lots of them were just wondering, you know, what else is the potential up here? And if you go up that space on a Saturday or on a Sunday or on any kind of week, you see that whole field filled with people, with walking dogs, to Frisbee, to disc golf, to, to soccer. And the possibilities can be endless. You know, we're about to do some winter fest activities there. Um, so, I just, I hope that you think about that. And also those pre-K, the second grade, right now that, that are, we're interned for basketball, we have no space for them. So those hundred kids that are playing soccer can't really play basketball. The only space that we have is very limited on Saturday and not that much space that we can host a hundred kids in a, in, a, in a gym. And so that's really sad to see those those sports not be able to grow. Um, I did want to talk about a little bit about the tennis. We have tennis for youth for several years here. Scott Barker has been our tennis academy coach um, that has worked for the city for you know, way over 10 years. Um, we do have a strong thing in for kids playing tennis. Um, but as you go to a high school, it's not the most popular sports that they do. We have a very strong soccer, basketball um, I coach varsity girls basketball at the high school. Um, so I also know the needs of the gym. And believe me, when I have practice until 9 30, 10 o'clock at night, I can tell you that those gyms are full and there's no space for us to even get into an open gym for our athletes there. So as we go through, um, we are in need of space. We don't have any space to create any more programming. So we are excited for the possibility to have that a little bit of space up there so we can grow as a rec department. It's amazing how we can bring the community together, um, not only with programming, but also in emergency, you know, situations as well as being a, a bigger place for an emergency, you know, situation there. So thank you for, for listening for me. Thank Thanks you. Heidi. This is very helpful, especially, you know, we've, we spent time having city council meetings at the high school after we were flooded out of here. And uh, it was always my impression that the gym wasn't full all the time. But so so having your perspective that the gym is really getting heavy use is, uh, is useful to me. Oh, yes. And, and both the ADs, you know, they have expressed the multi-use. We do cross country at the Elks. They do um, cross country skiing as as well up there. So we do communicate really well with the school. They have given us a lot more access to um, the gyms uh, for to, to provide some tournaments. So I do create those annual tournaments for our youth, uh, but it's just, it's not big enough. I can only do very small 
tournaments and I love tournaments. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, the capability is endless and just, we just don't have the, the gyms to do that here. And so we want to create. And so having that ability makes me very excited. So thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Uh, Rebecca. Hello. Um, I want to speak on behalf of my two kids who are here, but are nervous to speak <laughs> for themselves. Um, I just want to reiterate what Heidi said and what Mike said. Um, the the building, the space, the two, acre, two or three acres that you're talking about um, is one of the only field spaces in Montpelier. Um, I would really encourage you to go up to the VCFA College Green and walk around up there um, and imagine playing soccer on that field that is, um, it's a great size field, but it's um, essentially an ant's hill. It's all sand. Um, it's a really tough field to play on. Um, Jog River Field gets flooded. Um, it was not usable for the spring. Um, the uh, the Elks Club um, has, my son was, was plays soccer there um, and the middle school ultimate frisbee team practices there. Um, when you look at all the fields at the high school that are constantly in use, um, the Dog River fields and everywhere else, there's there's very little field space for our capital city. It's pretty pitiful. Um, you go to any other town and they have beautiful fields that they invest in and they put they put real resources into, um, and people come to them. There's tournaments. There's um, there's all sorts of you know huge amount of activity that comes through those just plain soccer fields and ultimate frisbee fields. Um, when we look at the the fellow who was um, who was presenting, who said um, young people don't use tennis courts, why would we be giving away a resource um, when kids that are in our town that are so often forgotten in these these bigger conversations, um, they're interested in tennis, in in soccer, they're interested in futsal, they're interested in basketball. Um, Volleyball is a rising sport. Um, let's invest in properties in, and ensure that we're not giving away our resources to sports that um, that aren't used by by a, a broader population of our town. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Steve, haven't forgotten you. I wouldn't let you. So. Steve Whitaker, um, I think we're having five different conversations mushed together here. Uh, we've got a tennis club hub proposal on the table, which barely got a fair hearing. We've got a rec center discussion that's been going on forever. We've got a housing development discussion and priority. We've got an emergency homeless shelter up there. And I'm going to add the new one because we do have a growth center application in, which is going to necessitate a lot of planning that hasn't been done and and an application for a new town center. And a new town center, I've been reviewing designations of town centers in the minutes from prior years. Bill was on that board for 14 years, I just learned today. And that may have something to do with why they're trying to allow Montpelier to get through without by, with violating the statute. But town centers are designated by their civic buildings. They had real problems with a public-private partnership and a private commercial interest pretending to be a civic building uh, in one of the town center designations. So this stuff needs to be really thought through and, and done in a careful process. We cannot afford to foreclose our options at this point. The due diligence, the engineering due diligence of what what that land, that property can support in the way of housing units, detached housing units, clustered housing units, uh, high rise, multifamily housing units, that work has not been done. We don't know what are the prime ag soils, what are the geology issues, what are the water stream flood issues, you know, that until we know, until we completed our due diligence and the transportation costs, the, the costs of new roads or bridges 
Uh, I know Steve Ribellini mentioned that if he, we had that seven acres that he has, maybe we could create craft a road switching back down the hill from there. But my point is that all that work that was supposed to be, they were the next step recommendations in the White and Burke report has been on hold. No RFP has been issued for any of that engineering. And I just, I'm shocked that we continue to barrel forward towards seeking a developer to start building some high rise before we know what other housing besides some high rise is gonna be able to be accommodated. But the membership model, I, I guess, I guess that whole discussion, I don't see, if I'm reading the room, there's no support for selling. Before we know what else we have to work with, we're not ready to sell the most prime piece of the property. So it's nice that I'm the first one to get timed and for some of these long run on. Uh, so we're kind of pitting housing versus recreation the way we're going about it. We need to complete our due diligence so that we can assess how much housing and how much recreation. But I don't think opening up rampant recreation is going to peacefully coexist with people who want to invest in private homes. So anyway, there's a lot of, uh, we also need a new town center is going to need light industry worker space. So it has to be, and, and it's a retail, a general store and a civic building, like a remote version of this so that people could participate in these meetings from, from there too, without having to drive into town. That kind of planning hasn't been done and it should have been done before we applied for the growth center. Uh, that's comes up next Monday. So right now we've allowed farming, agriculture, the, Feast Farm, Frisbee Golf, a homeless shelter, and soccer. And we need to untangle and get our due diligence done on what are the what's the carrying capacity and what are the investments that are going to be required. We may still have to sell it. If you finish that due diligence and, know, and show the public what the cost of getting that ready to develop are going to be, the town may vote to sell it. But my point is that we have run off track on what we need to be doing to get these decisions answered. Thanks, Steve. <clears throat> Come on up. Yeah. Hi, folks. Sandy Fitztomb, 14 Loomis Street. I want to thank Steve for... Where'd he go? Did he leave? Steve Ribellini. Yeah. Outside the door. Oh, okay. Um because I think that he is making a very generous offer and it could solve some of the problems that we think face the site. Also, I wanted, um, I'm wanted i really excited about a tennis group wanting to start a new business inside Montpelier. Um, my boys played futsal and um, soccer and used indoor facilities. Um, with global warming, it's hard to forget how incredibly precious indoor athletic space is. Um, but I also understand the housing issue. My one point tonight is um, that the infrastructure onto the site is going to be a challenge. It's gonna be a lot higher demand of storm water um, as well as traffic than we now have going up to the Elks Club. And I think it really is important to get that um, preliminary design done, basically a master plan done as soon as possible um, so that we don't lose opportunities like Steve and the Hub are suggesting, or Blueberry, excuse me, Blueberry, excuse me. Um, uh, Steve's I think great offer is not going to last forever, <laughs> but um, uh, I don't know how we can leverage getting really solid master planning done really quickly. I think you were waiting for the growth center approval, maybe, I don't know, but if there were some way to do some besides Montpelier funding it, getting some extra grants, getting, um, people who have uh, the ability to make some kind of contribution to get the 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 sizable planning done of how are we going to get stormwater off that hill and how are we going to get traffic on and off the hill is really key. 
before we figure out. For instance, it may be a lot less expensive to have roads go straight through rather than around the building. Thank you. Thanks, Sandy. Just to, to address what uh, the question that you and Steve Whitaker just raised, I couldn't tell you the date, but a while back, the council voted on a, on a plan, um, a, a stepwise plan, rezoning, um, growth center designation, TIF application, and then doing engineering study. And we've done the rezoning. We've uh, got a growth center designation. We're moving forward on that. And uh, and so, so you're right. That's all stuff that needs to be done. And that is in the works. Yeah. We have that too, because there's a lot of information flying around here. Uh, see if I can put some organization to it. Um, don't know where to start. So I think first is that the the initial process, the initial public process that we did, um, said housing and rec, and we the, the conceptual plan lays out the two different areas. So when we're talking about rec, we're talking about the area for rec. When we're talking about housing, so we're not really talking about meshing them. Now housing could potentially be on the rec area, especially if we built a new building and had upper floor housing. But we we've been looking at these on parallel tracks. So talking about the rec area tonight isn't preventing us from talking about the, the housing area. So that's one piece. Uh, number two, we uh, did put out a, a request for proposals for qualifications for a bunch of engineering firms earlier in the year. We have some blanket openings and we are actually working out the final details on contracts to do all that design. Uh, could be for the council soon as the next meeting, maybe. I don't know where we're at. I'm kind of trying to catch Kurt's eye to see if we're close, but I know it, it's happening. So that is in the works. That is designing all the water, sewer line, storm, road, all, all of that to get that laid out so that we will know what it costs and it will actually be designed, not just estimated. Um, so that's happening. Number three, we are not seeking a new town center. Um, that, I don't know, you know where you got that, Steve. That's a whole different thing. Uh, it's a growth center only, which will then allow us, we could actually get a TIF district without the growth center, but it's easier to get it with the growth center. As you've correctly noted, there's, uh, we still need to have a plan. We need to have the map and we have to have our city plan, our master plan say, designate this as a growth center. So the state has approved our growth center application. They're reconsidering it on Monday, likely to create a condition that it's not in effect until our city plan has adopted that, um, which shouldn't hold us up at all. We can still begin with the TIF project. So that housing piece is all happening as it should be. Now we're talking about REC. Um, two other points I just want to make, and this is not trying to argue for or against anything, but just I think there's, again, just because I, I hear things and maybe there's misconceptions. Number one, if we chose not to do the rec center, not to renovate the rec center for rec use and build a new center somewhere else, and that 55 Bear Street was then transformed into something else, we would not necessarily anticipate that the city would be spending that money. So that would, in that case, it would be transferred to parts of the state, downstreet, somebody like that, and they would be raising the funds for the housing, creating the shelter. So I just want to be clear, the city won't be paying twice. We won't be paying to build a new rec building and renovate. You know, we're going to make a decision at some point what we're going to do, but we're not on the hook twice. The second thing, and I, I don't know how this, if it's even relevant, to this conversation, but I think it's just important to understand the history uh, about the, the conversations between the city and the hub, because as I mentioned earlier tonight, the hub had actually been working with Steve Rubellini um, prior to the city becoming interested in the property and was interested in doing this project up there. And it was actually us who intervened and we went to them and said, hey, if you're gonna be building rec, sh should we be planning together so that we're not duplicating services? And if we're gonna be building new facilities, Again, recognizing in, in the opinion at the time was we shouldn't be investing on the Barry Street building. 
And so we initiated that conversation, eventually concluded that it made more sense for the city to own the property. So we went forward. The hub folks actually supported um, the bond, which, you know, I suspect they've regretted because we've had, you know, public process since then, which has held up their their decision making. So I think that is why they were one of the stakeholders as part of the um, power wellness program and why they recommended that we see if we could figure out something that allowed them to do what they're doing and still keep the city's options open. And, um, you know, again, I'm one, you know, I had the same question somebody else asked us, could it be built to also include other, other facilities? You know, could we, I, I have a zillion ideas, which I won't share with you all out loud right now, but um, anyway, I just wanted to bring some perspective to all of these conversations. Cause I know some people are jumping in at different times may have nothing to do with the outcome of what the council decides to do, but I just, it's good as things get thrown around in a meeting, it's good to sort of understand where things started. Done my speech. Thanks Bill. Where we are right now is there's, we're not at the point of making a decision yet. And I am conscious of the need to respect people's needs for, uh, for breaks. And so we usually take a break at eight 30. I'm going to take the break now, give people a chance to, uh, maybe especially members of the council to think about, um, where we should go with this. And we will reconvene at, uh, 851. Uh, in that meantime, I will uh, be talking to Bill to see if there are things that we should jettison from tonight's agenda because it's already looking like a late night. So see you back here in 10 minutes. I will call us back to order. We've uh, We've done some work on the agenda. We are taking item 13 off for the settle, settlement agreement, discussion of settlement agreement on the uh, set of uh, tax assessment appeals. So that will be taken up another night. Um, we have a strategic plan quarterly report that is uh, in the packet and we're not gonna take time to uh, discuss it to tonight and uh, if council members want to have time to discuss it after uh, after they've reviewed it, we can set that up for another meeting. And what did we decide about? Okay, and we will take off the tax stabilization policy item nine for another night. So if you're here for any of those items or signed up for any online for any of those items you do not need to stay all right folks um part of what we're kind of faced with deciding today is do we proceed with uh, the next phase of the uh, feasibility study before we decide what to uh, as as to get us prepared to decide what to do um, with the property, with the recreation part of the property and with the um, and the the recreation planning. Um, we could get into all kinds of things like are we going to sell part of the property to uh, to the hub or anybody else, but I don't sense that we're in a position to decide that, or at least at a minimum, I don't sense we're in a position to vote yes on that. But I'm interested to hear what other council members have to say. Make a motion that we not continue with the second phase of the feasibility study at this point until we decide how we want to proceed with this property. Um, and if we're going to have a, a continued city presence in terms of recreation facilities there, we certainly will have paths and fields and other recreational opportunities. But if we're going to be building uh, capital projects, then this would be appropriate. But at this point, I don't feel it is. So that's my motion. 
you don't need to make a motion not to do something. We wouldn't do something unless you firmly you approved it. We're not going to go ahead with this unless you vote okay. to do it. So you want a council vote to say yes or no? If you don't vote yes, then we won't do it. Okay. That's it. So it's a, you know I mean I'm just, we, we'll hold. So you want me to make a motion to do it even though I don't want it? No, no. no. <laughs> you don't need to do anything with it. You don't need to do anything with this. I think it's just we're just wondering how you want to proceed, and if that's not it, then we don't need to. That's do not that. what I want, but I don't know. But but if you do, if you make a motion, you're still allowed to vote against your motion. But uh, but, yeah. but you don't have to. Do I have that. done that once. Yeah. yeah. Um, so. Well, I'm looking at the. If I understand it here. Not Phase one of the feasibility study, uh, we, we've done very little part of that, right? The little, just, yeah. the first three lines or so. So consumer market research, just strategic partner research, segmentation, demand projections, price acceptance. I mean, wasn't that all part of Ballard King? I mean, which we Some of just barely did. Um, so, I mean, I guess I agree at, at the moment. Let's Let's wait and see if, you know, how much of this we really need and um i mean I, I hate to keep postponing stuff but it just seems to me that uh we we have some of this information maybe it's not all completely up to date but let's let's wait and see um anybody else who want to take a different position on that mm. Looking to council members who are participating remotely, if anyone wants to be heard, uh, Adrian. Can you just explain what you all just said again? It was a little confusing. So what are we? So are Tim, we... Tim was going to make a motion in the negative to not do something. And, and typically you don't need to do that. You know, motions should be made in the positive. And so all I was saying is if you don't vote to do the rest of the phase one, we won't do it. We put that out here and saying... So if, if if you don't take an action to do it, we that's why if this was something we were going to do administratively, we would have done it and we wouldn't have asked you, but we put it on the agenda. So if you don't want to do it, just don't make a motion or vote against it or whatever. That's all. I was just trying to, it's, and people are talking that maybe they don't want to do that and that's okay. That's what you want. And so then if we decide that we are not going forward with uh, with this uh, feasibility study, then the next question is, well, how do we decide how to proceed? Two questions. One, I'd like to build the brig. So it sounds like if we sell any piece of the property at any point, we technically don't have to do an RFP, but it seems like good public process, if we're going to do this, to do that with each phase if we intend to do it to allow potential bids. Um, so in the other question we got is we do have a proposal on the table from the hub, which they, they've been in conversation with Bill for a long time. It feels like we at least owe them some indication of, is this a conversation we want to continue on with to see if it can work out? Or if there really is an interest in the council, it'd also be nice to tell them that now and, and let them decide where they go next. Mm -hmm. uh, so for that, I would call for an executive session so we can discuss their offer and uh, give them some indication of our thoughts on if this conversation is one we'd like to continue. So you are making a motion to go into executive session to discuss negotiating or securing real estate pur purchase or lease, lease options pursuant to 1 VSA section 313A2. Correct. <laughs> and uh, and in the alternative, since we're not, this isn't, well, is there a second to that motion? I'm sorry. Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. So we are going into executive session and we can decide who comes into executive session with us. Obviously the uh, the city manager would come in. Is there any other member of city staff that needs to be here, Bill? I'll probably say no. Part motion, one premature findings. Not for this one, thanks. 
Um, okay, so where do we where, in here? I'm going to, I think Katie's on this one. She's okay. okay. First off, we'll need a motion to uh, come out of executive session. Is there a second? Second. Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? All right. Next, Tim, do you have a motion? Okay, for the city council to consider pursuing the concept of selling the building in about three acres, um, we'd like to authorize or ask the city manager um, to have an engineer assess the additional seven and a half acres to see if a second ingress egress road is possible um, on that site because that does impact what? And the appraisal. Yeah. Okay. yeah, that's next. And then we also have a, an appraisal done of the property in this configuration to have a sense of market value. And if if this all works out and heads, moves forward, we will want to engage in an RFP process uh, following that. So that's my RFP, motion. Is the RFP part of your motion or not? Yes. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. This has been uh, a long, but uh, but I think a, a good discussion, uh, given the complexity of the issues involved. Thanks for coming in, guys. And we are now up to item number eight, uh, water resource recovery facility. Sorry, there's people, I think, confused about what this did. Oh, okay. So I, just to be clear, the council didn't make any decisions about which way we're going to proceed. He simply said, let's find out what the real value of the property is and find out what value is so that we can are better informed to make a decision. And if we do choose to sell it, then we're going to follow an RFP process. So I don't people, yeah. I just want to be clear about that. There wasn't, they didn't say they were or were not selling anything. So it didn't say no or yes to anyone. Yeah. Question clarification. Uh, you know, Steve's offer is only good through the end of the calendar year. Yeah. This sounds pretty open-ended, like it could take months, and we really don't have months. Maybe I'm wrong that it doesn't have to take that long, but that's a question. It'll really be driven by how long it takes the appraiser to get the work done. But we, we got the whole parcel appraised when we uh, bought the property, so we're hoping that we can get a, a shortcut to an appraisal of the smaller part of it. And what about a commercial appraisal of the building? I, I know you're planning to do that as yeah. well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all. Next up, water resource recovery facility. And Kurt, you're up. And you're going to show us uh, some pictures up here, right? Yes. Yeah, for this, I think we should. Is that right? I have another. Could we do just these middle We can. Yeah, is that what Steve thinks? Right. What's that? Right, he's, he's not the boy. Okay. 
We can just use the mouse to the, wheel it. The mouse doesn't actually work. Okay. Doesn't want to work with it. So yes, you got, okay. the, got the touch pad. I'm gonna put those over here. Yeah. Uh, good evening. I'm Kurt Modica, Public Works Director. Uh, with me tonight is Colin O'Brien with Brown and Caldwell. He's a consulting engineer working with us on the water resource recovery facility um, biosolids drying project. Uh, we also have um, two other members of the Brown and Caldwell team online that will be um, helping us answer questions at the end of the presentation. Um, Diane uh, Nascimento and John Ross are on as well. Um, so just uh, the topics that we'll be covering tonight. Uh, we'll go through um, background of the project when uh, what is really driving the work for the biosolids dryer as well as the other upgrades at the, uh, at the plant, the project status, um, construction cost estimate and schedule update, uh, a funding update, and then the next steps. Okay, we'll go through the project background, Kurt, some of the drivers. So the drivers for the project are um, need for more stable management of the biosolids um, given regulatory uncertainty. So that's um, largely around uh, land application of biosolids um, as well as concerns with, with uh, PFAS that are within the biosolids, which will um, likely become uh, further restrict uh, our ability to, or um, municipalities ability to do to do land application currently the city does landfill all of our biosolids um, also we have a um, we've had odor complaints and we also have a notice of alleged violation so a permit violation on um, odor issues coming from the plant um, the project also addresses goals for energy reduction um, and the last piece of aging infrastructure that was not done in the previous upgrade is the secondary clarifiers and then an adder, um, something that was added to the project sort of midway was uh, upgrades to the ultraviolet disinfection system because um, the ballast cards, the controls of the equipment is no longer supported or manufactured. And then getting into some of the major project elements, uh, the new biosolids dryer and advanced thermal treatment, you'll see that referred to as ATT just for ease, ease for the rest of the presentation. The relocation of the waste gas burner and generator, which were additional projects add as we developed into more detailed design, <clears throat> HVAC modifications uh, to reduce energy consumption, the odor co control system for headworks and dewatering in response to the NOAV received by DEC, the secondary clarifiers upgrades, including new mechanisms and effluent launder covers, <clears throat> Return flow pump station for side stream flows from dewatering building and new dryer facility, which is another new project element that occurred as we dove into detailed design, the hot water loop additions evaluation, and as Kurt mentioned, the UV equipment upgrade, which is going to be added in the next design milestone. And for benefit of people who may not be following this uh, intimately, you use the initialism NOAV. Noticed of alleged violation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, getting into the project status. So just to give some background before I get into this slide too. Um, spring of 2021, the city began a feasibility study as a PER, preliminary engineering report. Uh, fall of 2021, recommendations from that were presented uh, given concerns on PFAS in biosolids as well as increasing tip fees, disposal costs that we're seeing across the region. In spring of 2022, a bond vote was approved um, from then which USDA RD funding was secured for the project in the fall of 2022, which allowed the engineering to begin um, subsequently. And that's where we are today presenting on these updates. Um, as far as where we are at, with the selection of the ATT equipment, we have issued an RFP at the end of June on schedule. We received bids at the end of July, which was on schedule. Um, and we had prepared a draft pre-selection made by early September. And those of you that have looked at further slides, you'll see that the cost came back significantly higher than we originally anticipated. And that's why we're here today to check in with council. 
our selection criteria and the ranking of the two qualified vendors that submitted. Uh, BioFest, BioForce Tech Corp was the selected vendor. Um, the ranking criteria that we developed with city staff, DEC, and USDA are there as well. So kind of to put the bow on that timeline that I was describing, we are currently at, we have vendor proposals and are ready to make an award recommendation. And we have a 30% design that is complete on all the other project elements. Um, and that updated design also includes construction cost estimate, which we will talk through in, in later slides. To give some visual representation of what we're talking here, uh, working clockwise, uh, the relocated white waste gas burner from the from the bottom left, uh, that was a new project element that was added uh, given the siting and the expansion of one of the facility buildings needed to accommodate the equipment, the dryer building max footprint. So that increased from the PER phase, the secondary clarifiers that was included in the original scope, the dewatering OCU, OCU stands for odor control unit, the UV replacement, the relocated generator, which was a new addition, the return flow pump station, a new addition, and the Headworks odor control unit. Um, so one of the things we decided to look at with this project, which this was actually um, partially funded through a Efficiency Vermont grant, is to um, uh, look at expanding the heat loop at the plant and um, also look at connecting the heat loop to the public works garage. So um, what we call the barn at the public works garage, which is just adjacent to the, the wastewater plant, uh, it has a very old um, oil furnace that needs to be replaced. And the city's actually um, passed a bond to construct a, a pellet boiler um, to replace that old um, heating system. Um, but uh, as part of this project, we decided it made sense to look at potentially connecting those two heating systems. So. Um, most of the buildings at the wastewater plant are on a hot water loop. So there's several boilers within different buildings, um, as well as the main dual fuel boilers, uh, which can run methane or oil. Um, th those buildings are all connected in hot water loop. There's one building that is currently not. It's called the chemical building, which is sort of halfway to the garage. And then potentially the new building um, for, the, for the dryer unit. Um, we'd also looked at connecting that. So Brown and Caldwell um, conducted a, an evaluation looking at the life cycle cost of um, of the equipment, life cycle cost of the, um, you know, replacing um, the boiler at the garage, and uh, sort of looked at all the different alternatives and um, also ties in well with um, potential added needs for, um, for the dryer unit um, to, uh, under one of the options that we'll be uh, discussing later on. Um, so that would also allow for bi-directional heating. So... We could send heat from the new pellet boiler uh, located at the equipment barn at the garage to the plant if something went down there, or if we had excess methane, we could bring that renewable energy uh, to the garage to heat um, the barn building, the equipment barn. Um, so just a, a little more in depth on what the different um, scenarios that we looked at with the heat loop. Uh, the base case was um, sending biogas to the dryer building only. So we're going to construct a new building um, to dry the biosolids, and that building obviously is going to have a heating demand. So that's sort of the um, sort of the lowest cost extension of the heat loop. And then uh, we also looked at um, running it to the chemical building, as I described, which is sort of the one existing building at the facility that is not on this heating loop, has its independent oil, boil, oil, oil boiler at that building now. Um, and then uh, the scenario two is looking at going all the way to the garage as well as the chemical building. And then if we, um, a second step back and looking at it um, without the, the dryer is um, is just sending it to the, um, if, if the council decides not to go forward with the dryer, then there's an option to go uh, to the garage and um, and the chemical building. So the conclusions of that study, so there's a technical memo available um, that's uh, really specific to this analysis, um, is um, that the, the dual fuel boiler, which can run the methane that's existing at the um, at the wastewater plant in the dewatering building, um, it does have the capacity to 
um, to feed and serve or heat all of the buildings within the wastewater plant campus. Um, and if you look at the life cycle cost by bringing it out to the garage, um, it's uh, it's competitive um, uh, as opposed to installing a standalone pellet boiler at the garage. And the capital cost of extending the heat loop all the way to the public works garage is, a, is approximately 650000 Um, one other sort of curveball that uh, has come across um, as we're working through this project is that we have received our draft new discharge permit for the wastewater plant, water resource recovery facility. And uh, in that permit now we have new limits for ammonia and nitrogen, which we've never had before, as well as arsenic limits that we've never had. Um, and essentially we have five years to meet these new limits. And uh, so we are you know, so incorporating potential treatment methods to ensure that we're going to meet these limits um, uh, within this design, or at least um, we haven't actually designed those components because we don't know the scope of the dryer project at this point with, with certainty, and we're only at 30% design, but that's just another factor in how we advance this project. Okay, moving into the construction cost estimate and some schedule updates. Uh, the current bonded amount, when I was laying out that timeline, was $16.4 million uh, with a remaining bond from the Phase 1 improvements, the WRRF, of $4.9 million. Pending the bids that we received from the two bidders, as well as an updated construction cost estimate to now be reflective of a detailed design, the total project cost came in at $32.4 million, which is much higher than we were anticipating when this project was originally bonded. We broke this out um, to identify approximately $22.4 million attributed to the dryer and ATT facility with $10 million, all other project elements. So that includes the elements that are included in this design that, that came along the way as this project advanced in this milestone. Some of the reasoning for that cost increase, uh, the escalation from the time frame that it took to establish that PER, present, get a bond vote, and then move to this design, played into that. Updated equipment code quotes, this is reflective across the board, right? For the RFP that we issued for the ATT, as well as all of the additional equipment that was either added or needed to be updated to be reflective of 2024 pricing. Further development of design, right? we were able to do our geotechnical investigation at the plant, as well as a detailed survey, as well as an underground utilities investigation that gave the city staff and my engineering team a lot more information of what we were working with at the facility. And then some of the time delays that played into this was obviously there have been two significant flood events uh, during the duration of this project so far. I, we included this in here uh, just to provide some context to the increases, so I won't step through every item. Uh, we're more than happy to go through this during the Q&A period, but the column uh, second from the left is the cost uh, for some of these detailed projects elements as of the September 2024 estimate. The one to the right of that is for the June 2022 cost estimate, and then the delta, the increase of that is the column to the right of that. Again, for this slide, I will not step through um, every element of these charts. These, This is the same uh, life cycle cost that was presented when we looked at the project back in 2021, 2022, uh, and the bond decisions were made. Key columns to take note of is the status quo. So you'll see there's a Casella disposal cost as well as market rate cost. And we'll get into this a little later on in the presentation, um, but right now, the city receives uh, significantly discounted disposal costs in comparison to what the market cost for those disposals are. So as we talk about life cycle costs and the benefits of this project or some of the benefits of current disposal options that the city has, we wanted to be transparent on those different life cycle figures, which are obviously vastly different uh, when you look at those two options. Project schedule, uh, just to show uh, we when we started this project, this detailed design 
portion of the project. In 2024, we have moved along uh, as best as we can on schedule. Uh, the only delay that we've seen to date is, is making a recommendation on the ATT technology, uh, which again was paused because we wanted to have this discussion with council. Funding update, Kurt. Yep. So just to review the funding for this project, um, we do have a USDA grant. It's approximately three and a half million. That is for both East State Street and this project. So we haven't decided exactly how that grant funding will be allocated between the two projects, but there is that. We also, with the USDA loan funding, it's low interest, 2.3% approximately interest rate, which um, does help over the 30-year uh, uh, loan term. Um, there is uh, emerging contaminant funding, grant funding through DEC, um, but that's only if we continue on with the $32 million project, which actually um, deals with the PFAS and the biosolids. Um, that's only, and the funding for that is limited to $2 million over two years if we were to be awarded the full amount. Um, as Colin mentioned earlier, we have from the phase one upgrade project, we came in under budget on that by approximately four point. Nine million um, with the grant funding that we received on that project, uh, which we have had a legal opinion that um, that has determined that that funding or that bond remaining bond amount could be used towards this project. Uh, there's also an opportunity to adjust our rates for uh, external hauled waste, so septage that's brought in, municipal sludge, high strength waste, um, all of those fees could be potentially increased to help cover the cost of this project. Um, and then at uh, at some point, potentially, we could uh, modify our leachate revenue. Right now, if we raise leachate rates, they raise disposal rates. And so there's no net gain currently. But if we were decoupled from the disposal needs by advancing a dryer project, uh, that would potentially open up some options for the city for leachate um, fees. <clears throat> uh, there's also um, an agreement with en uh, energy uh, systems group ESG that constructed the phase one project under design build. Um, some of the work they did has contributed to the odor violations that we have on the project. So they have had to have agreed to contribute to the cost for some of that work um, under this project. And then uh, not on the slide, but uh, the town of Berlin also through our contract with them um, contributes um, approximately 10% to capital upgrades at the plant. So that will reduce the total project cost by that amount. Um, and so some of the things that will help guide our decisions on, uh, on how to move forward, um, one is our new permit, as I mentioned. We have uh, new limits, and um, we need to take that into account as we look to advance this project. Um, we need to consider the volatility in biosolids disposal. So right now we have a really cheap price because we take leachate. If that goes away, um, we're going we're gonna to go to market rate, which is um, you know about $100 per ton more than what we pay now. So several hundred thousand dollar increase annually. Um, and like I mentioned, that um, that is uh, impacted by leachate uh, acceptance. Um, but leachate also has impacts on um, on some of our, uh, our limits. So ammonia is impacted by leachate acceptance. So we need to consider that as well. Um, and then finally is the, the city's net zero goals. Okay, and just a little bit on the volatility of biosolids disposal cost uh, that I've mentioned. Um, from what we are seeing uh, with peer utilities in other states in the area, there are currently coming up some bans on biosolids land application. And what that means is the only avenue for the biosolids to be disposed of is to go to the landfill. That is a thing in Maine currently, and Massachusetts and New Hampshire are considering, have not implemented, but are considering those. Currently, uh, Vermont DEC has some draft rulemaking in place uh, where land application or land spreading would be limited to background PFAS soil levels. So sites would be tested, uh, a determination of what the background soil levels are acceptable at a site would be determined, and then samples of the biosolids to be land applied would be allowed or disallowed based on that comparison. So that means basically we can, can't make it worse than it already is. That is the logic that DEC is using for that, yeah, as as we understand. Now, am I right? I, I 
had the impression, Kurt, that we already were sort of assuming not being able to do uh, land application as a means of disposing this. Is that is that recollection correct or not? Um, yeah, I mean, there are, uh, there are regulatory um, restrictions around land applications. So right now we don't dry at all. And um, so our biosolids are what's listed as unclassified. So it would be essentially impossible without doing some sort of upgrade to have the ability to land apply by doing just a dryer without the secondary, you know, advanced thermal treatment, which is the, the component that breaks down the PFAS. Um, that could potentially open us up to be able to land apply, but we'd still have to go through the permitting process for that. Okay, thanks. Okay, and Class A and Class B, what we're talking about, these are two different differentiators that EPA um, and then through DEC administers to determine different level of pathogen reduction with different biosolids projects. Uh, so in 2021, uh, for Class A disposal, we received a quote from a, a local disposal company. Local, when I say, is in, works in the region, is well known, well respected, of $35 a ton. Um, and just on our updated quote for this is only for Class A management, um, is $55 a ton uh, that meet PFAS screening values. So those screening values that we were talking through would need to be met to get that price. And if they don't meet those PFAS screening values, you're looking at just under $80 a ton. Dewatered cake, and that's where the plant currently is at. Current disposal cost is just under $83 a ton through Casella for the same disposal. Um, and again, just to reiterate that that $83 is reflective because the city currently has the ability to receive leachate. It's like a good partnership, um, essentially discounted cost. Without that in effect, uh, we're seeing costs of, of of about $185 a ton. So that's when we look at that uh, from a capital or an operating perspective, that would essentially double if we had to go with the non-Casella price, the cost that the city spends each year uh, to get rid of their biosolids. Okay. Project moving forward alternatives. So we've identified uh, three different options with the idea of understanding this, regardless of the path forward, is a significant capital investment for the city. So we have tried to put forward three options for consideration um, on options to move this to the next phase of the project. Option one would move forward the entire project as is that $32 million figure. Option two would move forward without the dryer and ATT. So that is just aging infrastructure that leaves the discussion for biosolids and the future disposal of that as kind of uh, an unknown. Option three, we would need to delay the project about three months, uh, move forward with the dryer, and pause to reevaluate ATT. And we're going to get into these options in more detail. Option one, move forward with the entire project. The pros of that, at the market value, the market rates, the non-Casella rates, there's about a 24-year payback uh, for cake disposal costs. It eliminates the use of the waste gas flare, except in emergency situations. Um, and the project has a pretty substantial greenhouse gas emissions reduction that it would see, mainly based on the reduced biosolids that would be going to the landfill. It provides the most flexibility and risk mitigation from biosolids disposal. And as Kurtz mentioned, it addresses the PFAS concerns. The cons, it requires a second bond vote in March of this year because we don't have enough funds in place to cover the entire value of the project. It would require, uh, in that same approach, pursuing additional grant funding, like Kurt mentioned, the CEC funding, uh, contaminants of emerging concern that are out there if the city does move to go in this direction, we would want to pursue those grant funding. It would increase the city's debt and it would delay the entire project schedule by three to six months because we would not want to advance the project until we had secured the bond vote. Option two, move forward without dryer and ATT. So that's just capital, the aging infrastructure items as well as odor control. The pros is it fits within the current bond. There's no additional bonding required, and we would not need to increase the 
current city's debt. It addresses the odor control and required process upgrades for the aging infrastructure, and it retains the current schedule. The cons is it does not eliminate the use of the waste gas flare. flare. We're going to have additional digester gas production, so that flare would still be used when we are in times that we can't fully utilize all of that digester gas. It does not address the volatility of biosolids disposal. It does not address PFAS concerns. And additional grant funding could be researched for a future dryer and ATT project, um, likely more delays and increased costs if we are to pursue on a second phase, if you will, of that project. Kurt, with option three. <clears throat> All right, so option three is to still do a drying project, but without the ATT or advanced thermal treatment, which is the component that deals with the PFAS. That's a high temperature treatment um, to sort of break apart the carbon bonds within um, the PFAS chains. Um, so this project is appealing in that, um, so when we all, when we started this phase, we initially looked at combined heat and power, like making power with a generator from the methane, and the numbers just didn't work. And so... Then we move to the dryer, and um, a dryer project fits well because we take in a lot of solids in the summer months. That's when there's low heat demand. And so um, this would allow us to utilize the methane for drying um, in the summer months at a more palatable uh, project cost. Um, but it does not deal with the PFAS. But it, also, but it does set us up for being able to add the secondary treatment, the paralysis or gasification, which deals with um, breaking apart the PFAS chains at a later date. So we um, can still keep that on the table. So um, a pretty short payback. If we were paying market rate, not taking leachate, it's a 13 year payback. Well, well um, within uh, the terms of um, the project cost, which is a 30 year term, um, we're still going to reduce our biosolids mass by 80 to 85%. So most of what we send to landfill right now is water. And this project would take the majority of that water out right now we have 23 percent solids going to the landfill and this would bring it up to like 85 or 90 percent um so in turn with that you pay by the wet ton so it's all scale based um disposal at the landfill so you reduce that water weight you pay a lot less um, for disposal costs and as i mentioned um this sets us up for the paralysis system to deal with the pfos at a later date hopefully when there's more grant funding available because um this is where things are heading. It's just the cost is really um, is really tough to swallow at this point with $32 million. And if we utilize the existing bond, remaining bond amount from the phase one project, we do not have to go back out to bond. So the delays on the project are really minimal. If we have to rebid equipment because we'd go a different route. Um, the first equipment we built, we bid, um, it was with different types of drying equipment. So one was, uh, a bio dryer, um, so sort of these big bins like compost bins, and the other bid was with a drum dryer, which is this a flame that shoots into a, a drum spinning, you know, relatively quickly. This project we're looking at a belt dryer, so it's kind of like a big pizza oven. Um, it's pretty simple, and it's much lower cost than the than the dryers that were submitted on the first equipment bid. Um, and so it seems like it, it, another way to just reduce costs is that the dryer itself is quite a bit less expensive than um, than uh, the bids that we got on the um, original equipment selection. Um, so the downside is three to six month delay. That's to do that uh, new equipment bid. Um, doesn't take out the PFAS. Um, and we really need, there'll be external heat source needed for this because you're not recapturing the energy within the biosolids. Um, so we have to, that's really why we're looking at adding the pellet boiler as, and tying it into the plant so that we have a renewable heat source to supplement the heat needed for this dryer. Um, and just kind of, like I mentioned, the, the pizza oven type style, this is um, kind of a cut sheet of what the dryer would look like. Um, we would still need a new building to house this. Um, and you can see on the left there that we'd sort of selected a spot that we could, in the future, add the advanced thermal treatment to deal with the PFAS under a separate project. And then if you look at the payback numbers for this project, um, you know, worst case, if we were to, well, not worst case, but if we were to maintain our um, reduced disposal costs for the entire 30 years um, or, or more, um, the total the payback time would be 38 years. Um, you know, that's 
that's honestly kind of unlikely given all the regulations around um you know our discharge permit and leachate treatment it's possible but um i, I don't know that i think it's it's unlikely just given all the variables that we would maintain our current disposal system for that long uh, if we don't and we pay market rate then it's the 13 year payback which is really a relatively quick payback on a project like this Um, so with that, I would just sort of open it up to, to council questions and, um, you know, just to kind of close on where DPW and Brown and Caldwell, I think, are landing on our recommendation is to go with option three, um, which is the sort of scaled back, just the drier project, as well as the odor control and the other aging infrastructure components um, and, and advance that forward with the idea that sometime in the future we'll be able to do do the advanced thermal treatment, um, which would deal with the PFAS and the biosolids. Thanks, Kirk. Folks, any questions? I I know I probably have some, but I'll let, let someone else go. Okay, um, <clears throat> let me start out by uh, asking, you know, I, I don't know as much of this about this stuff as some people, but uh, it, it kind of seems like PFAS treatment or PFAS and PFAS standards and P PFAS treatment are all still evolving. And uh, that that would what we put in now can we know that uh, it's it's going to meet the standards that we're faced with uh, 5 10 15 years from now does that militate in favor of uh, delaying on the drying part of the uh, part of the pro or the att part of the project So if we're, yeah, yeah, I'll call on a Brown and Caldwell um, <laughs> expert on this. Are you available to answer that one, John? I am. Take care, everybody. So it's a good question. Um, there is still a lot of evolving science around PFAS analytics and detection, um, not to mention what's gonna be regulatory acceptable from a permit standpoint. So right now, um, all the state agencies are waiting for the US EPA to finalize a risk assessment. And that's expected um, at the end of this calendar year. And that's gonna provide guidance. And so that will relate to um, permit regulations in the solid phase for biosolids land application, and then also the gas phase. So what we do know <clears throat> is that the technology that we're talking about, the thermal drying, um, it's precursor to the advanced thermal treatment technology. And there's <clears throat> there are studies and what what by the EPA to investigate um, its ability to meet limits if they were to occur. And what they find is that what happens is when you put the dried product into the advanced thermal treatment, you do thermally desorb the PFAS. So it transfers into the gas phase. So what you're doing is you are carbonizing the biosolids into like a charcoal into a biochar. And so the US EPA has published data that shows that PFAS is removed to non-detect levels. So it's then transferred into a gas phase and the pyrolysis unit has a thermal oxidizer and that combusts the PFAS in the gas phase. And that will destroy it to levels um, that there's bench scale testing and full scale testing <clears throat> that show um, essentially that is that is the best option we have for, for control of PFAS in the gas phase. So it's been permitted as a best available control technology, but also uh, Michigan just permitted that with an actual PFAS production level for the gas phase for a thermal oxidizer. So for all intents and purposes, um, the ATT we expect is the best available control technology. 
And so if you put in a dryer with a with ATT now or without, that is um, the first step in this process. So the dryer um, does get you to that first level, and then the ATT right now is is the most promising option for PFAS destruction. So to clarify that, it sounds like you're saying that belt the belt dryer at a minimum would not be incompatible with the future install installation of the ATT and it probably contributes to it being as effective and ready to uh, to turn the ATT uh, on to um, address the PFAS in, in whenever we decide to uh, to do that. Is that accurate? I agree. Thank you. That's a good way to put it. And that's why we, in the layout, I think for option three, you'll see, we try to show that at least a future pyrolysis unit could fit on the site. Mm -hmm. Sal, go ahead. Uh, we stopped taking leachate. That's a prerequisite for this or not? Um, no, this is... This is unrelated to whether the city takes leach yet, other than the disposal cost is impacted by that decision. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just what we wanted to call to attention with the two different disposal costs, like how leachate, it might not be for decision today, right, for this discussion, but it plays into the cost of overall disposal. So this re keep, keep gives continues for us to have the option to take, take leachate. Uh, yes, this um gotcha. right. the decision or which way we go with dry or without um it doesn't impact our decision currently okay. to, to accept leachate or not. Mm -hmm. And um You mentioned some funding uh, from Efficiency Vermont. Is uh, do we does any of these options either use the funding from Efficiency Vermont or require us to not use and give back some of the funding money to Efficiency Vermont if we choose it? Yeah, so the um, the contribution from Efficiency Vermont was to evaluate the heat loop, like to look at combining the um, hot water piping between the DPW garage facility and the plant. So we've already been awarded that money and um, we'll be reimbursing it now that that study has been completed. We'll be um, requisitioning reimbursement. Um, there may be other opportunities from them to contribute to the project. We haven't explored that in detail with them yet. Um, if we can you know, utilize more of the methane, I think they, they may help with this project. But it's not going to be large scale based on our past experience. It'll be, you know, relatively small numbers in the scheme of um, the cost of this project. Yeah. And all, all the options accomplish the uh, odor reduction goals. That's correct. And, um, is there an estimate of the, of the, uh, how long the period would be between be before we would reconsider uh, the at t system? Is that just completely optional? I mean, what would what would sort of prompt us to reevaluate that? I, I think one of those drivers is the EPA risk assessment that John had talked about. When that comes out at the end of this year, um, Kurt and Brown and Cobble have constant communication with DEC as well on this subject. So I think when we have a little better understanding of where they're heading, that would be an informative decision. I would also say the disposal cost option if some if discussions on leachate and how those discussions progress uh, would also warrant evaluating this again kurt anything else you'd add to that um <clears throat> yeah i mean one of the things i've been talking a lot uh, with dc about is um the need for them to help fund projects like this on a grander scale we really need a lot more grant funding and to do this and really make it more of a regional project, not so specific to just Montpelier. 
our facility is a regional facility. We take, you know, um, probably two thirds of all the septage in the entire state of Vermont, as well as some from other states. And um, just really trying to encourage DEC to see this project in that fashion and that we're trying to solve, you know, a PFAS issue that is well beyond Montpelier. Um, so my hope is that we'll get, that there's an opportunity at some point to get a, a lot more grant funding to make this project more feasible. This is kind of in a different sphere, uh, another example of the homeless situation. It's It's not just our problem it's a regional problem statewide problem but uh this at present the state isn't paying us to fix it yeah the, the two million available currently for the emerging contaminants is just it's not enough to to make the numbers on this project work with the with the advanced thermal treatment at this point in my opinion but mm -hmm. if council decides to advance it now, we can, and we can rebond, and we so, can advance that project if you want. So what, sure. is, is there any <laughs> serious reason for us not to go with option there three? <laughs> it, 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 this all sounds to add up to almost a no-brainer for option three, but, but uh, that's probably because I don't understand the issues enough to be clear on it. Is it, is it, a real clear case that three is the way way to go. Uh, I think so. If you look at um, the potential volatility and our disposal costs, this gives us some assurance, right? Uh, and it's also the first step in doing the full treatment process. Um, so yeah, to take risk, risk management for the cities and our future costs, uh, I, I do think it is the right choice to advance option three. Mm -hmm. So I'll go ahead. Uh, under the current. Figures. What is the what is the broken out cost of the AT and T? You mean just that yeah, as a yeah, separate what, project later yeah, on? What, yeah. What what would that cost be? Assuming it doesn't double again in two years. <laughs> <laughs> So the dryer and ATT facility is twenty two point four. Uh, I would defer. Diane, do you have figures in front of you of just ATT? No, I mean, unfortunately, the you know the bid from the vendors is everything lumped together, right? It's not separated. So we we could take a guess. Um, Go ahead. <laughs> 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 Twenty-two point um, three. <laughs> we. I mean, it's it's definitely less than half. I think, yeah. but I mean, John, you probably have a better guesstimate than I would. Yeah. It, so, what makes this difficult? The the equipment itself for the the pyrolysis, essentially, it's it's a package plant. The equipment cost itself is about three and a half million. And then oftentimes by the time you construct it and you account for that building, it's, it's about double, right? So what makes this difficult is that a lot of the reason that our costs escalated so much is because the, the building to house the dryer and the ATT, um, <clears throat> the the site work um it was it was additive right and so you know essentially right now with the, the high level estimate just for that belt dryer facility only it's it's a substantially smaller building and so that cost can't right now is, is is essentially on the order of like 10 or 11 million right diane and so even though the pyrolysis process equipment and installation it's roughly about seven or eight there's probably three or four million on top of that. That is the added facility cost. So I'd say it is about a delta of um, ten to twelve, roughly, between just a dryer project and a dryer and ATT project. If if that makes sense. Ten to twelve. Okay. Anything else? Any members of the council? Lauren, I was I was wasn't didn't want to put you on the spot, but I do want to hear from you. So I'm glad you're raising your hand. 
Yeah, no, sorry. I'm not feeling well, so not able to participate. Great. But um, I, I think option three makes total sense. I actually, I mean, given how much of an evolving technology, I think um, they laid out well the, you know, the issues with upcoming regulations that are evolving, like in parallel as the technology is evolving. I think even though, you know, delaying means I'm sure we'll end up paying more if we do move forward with the same technology, but it'll give more time for more projects to hopefully come online and we can learn and make sure that this is the direction we want to go for the city. Um, I do continue to have some concerns about what sounds like we're basically creating a gas that could become have PFAS that then we're just kind of spewing into our air if we're not careful. So I just don't want to create a contamination zone. So I think having more time to study it and assess is actually prudent and good. So I, I'm happy with option three. Lauren, that's great to hear because in this area, I pretty much never want to be disagreeing with you on the ideas of what we should do. Um, anybody else? So you're looking for a motion to tell for us to give you direction on where to go. Yes, that would be helpful so we can um, advance yeah. the selected design option. Is somebody ready to make a motion? Although we um, approve option three is proposed and recommended by Public Works. Is there a second? Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Lauren. Next, we're up to item 10, uh, development agreement. Josh and Mike? Or just Josh? Josh Jerome, Planning Department. Um, I know tax stabilization has been kicked. Um, it's really late. I think we should probably just kick the development agreement because it's it's something Gabe, I already talked to Gabe. He's okay with that. Um, and I don't think uh, anybody has, you know, uh, the, the energy to really get into the set at this point. Works for me. Thanks. So. Okay. Item yep. 11, preliminary budget discussion. So Sarah, you're the one who gets to, to <laughs> ran, wrangle the uh, fatigued council members. Um, So while Sarah is up for her presentation, um, and I just remind you that this is uh, kind of a preliminary look at your next meeting, although it's filling up fast, um, the next meeting. The plan was that we would be presenting you a much more, you know, kind of our first draft budget before we go into our budget deliberations to seek some specific guidance. Uh, I mean, I think we'll still be on target to have added few things from tonight, including use of country club road camping. So, um, you know, we, we, we might be here for a while next time too. The real takeaway, uh, other than for you to be informed about the stuff Sarah's going to talk to you about is, um, we really want to make sure you have a chance to talk and give us whatever feedback you want about the actual budget process, how you'd like to review the budget. You know, last year we were pushed back because of the flood. And I know people wished they'd had more time or more, you know, different way to look at it. So we want to make sure we are clear how you want to proceed. So with that, turn it over to finance director. Yes. Uh, so finance director, Sarah LaCroix. Um, this is just a recap of the memo I provided. So I'm going to move through it relatively quickly. It is a very preliminary look at FY26. Um, right now, uh, we are coming up on budget season and it is going to be a challenge. We are still recovering from 23 and 24 flooding. Um, the FY25 budget reductions were added back as the baseline so that we can see what that looks like. Um, that has a significant impact. 
We no longer have ARPA money available to supplement projects or equipment, um, so that funding source has dried up, and we still have the deferred equipment and projects that we started deferring when the pandemic hit and continued as the flood um, hit us as well. I also, in this, am talking about the future bonding request we'll have. Just a, It was a request, and so we kind of tried to register a list. We don't have um, dollar values on all of them because some of them are well into the future, but they're just to register need or potential need. Um, and then I've included the federal rates on here, um, Social Security for 2025. The COLA is 2.5%. Um, currently, CPI for all urban consumers across the U.S. is 2.4 percent um, as of the end of September, and then in our region, it was 3.4 percent. So just some labor statistics for inflationary reference and Social Security COLA as we go into the budget season. Um, so FY26 has some more challenges than 25 did because we took all of these out of 25 and um, are trying to work them back into 26. Um, it's about $900,000 add back right out of the gate. Um, and so it includes things that were cut like the housing trust fund and country club road legislative advocacy, as well as the police department, finance department, public works and recreation department positions that were cut from the prior budget and the um, AmeriCorps that was cut from parks budget. Um, so this puts a lot of pressure um, to add these items back from the start for consideration. Um, and then, you know, <clears throat> two slides for challenges because it's going to be a fun year. Uh, all of our collective bargaining agreements end in June of 2025. So we don't have set rates that I can put in for anybody's um, pay increases for 26 at this point. Um, our health insurance, we got a rate increase back at 22.2% from the prior year, which was a bit of sticker shock. We expected to be somewhere in the 15% range. Um, so right now we are working to try to bring that down to 15%, but it we are running out of tools that are not going to be substantive plan changes to try to reduce costs in the future. And what we've heard is it sounds like we will be hit with a base rate increase from Blue Cross Blue Shield over the next few years of at least 7%, um, regardless of our experience. And our experience hasn't been great, as in we have been spending more than the plan is collecting. And so they're trying to, you know, catch up on that. So um, if we don't see leveling out of our plan utilization, we could be seeing large increases in the future too. Uh, which will put more pressure on the budget. Uh, Sarah, excuse me, when you're talking about uh, health insurance, I know uh, where I work, we were looking at uh, health insurance this year, and it looked like it was potentially around $130,000 difference between Blue Cross and MVP. Uh, are we analyzing Yep. So we've that is a possible change. Yep. We've requested a quote from MVP um, to see what it looks like with a comparable plan. Um, there is some risk that, you know, they could be really appealing in year one and get us with the same increases in year two. And we may or may not have the ability to flip flop back to Blue Cross. So they're just, there are some logistical issues there, but we are investigating it to see if we can, um, you know, gain any there. Um, but I'm not sure, we just aren't sure at this point. Mm -hmm. um, right now, I have started to build the budget, assuming health insurance is going up 15%. Um, but I hope to know more in the next week or two, because if I need to bump it up to 22, it'll, to give you the full picture, I'll do that. Um, and then our VLCT insurance renewal increase is unknown. We've just worked through the renewal packet, and um, that was one that we found out about late in the budget season last year and had to come up with another $100,000 worth of cuts. Um, I don't know what our increase looks like this year, but our experience hasn't been great. Um, so <laughs> I expect it could be sizable this year as well. And we have to start carrying um, NFIP insurance on the flood damaged buildings. Uh, we will start carrying them at the minimum amount, um, but FEMA will require us to carry NFIP insurance um, on the value they pay to fix these buildings. So um, it's been pretty clear that that is not an insurance policy we will be able to get. So I don't expect we'll have huge costs related to that. Um, however, we will have to get waivers and jump hoops so that in the next disaster, FEMA will pay for um, 
any project damage. And then uh, right now the pressure is exceeding current inflationary rates. Um, and that's being seen across all departments operationally and in capital. We still have some reappraisal appeals that are hanging out there as well as flood abatements that could come because they can come at any time um, to request that abatement. So we could still see um, asks for that that will impact the bottom line. And then the IT services contract is up this year. And so that's a big unknown as far as what to budget for that um, because I'm, I just don't know what we'll get back in RFPs, but I do, our current vendor expects a sizable increase. Um, so I just wanted to prepare everyone for that because that, regardless of what we budget, we could still be hit with a change that um, is unfavorable um, after the RFP results come back. Um, so then I moved on to the capital improvement plan. Um, most of the revenue downgrades we experienced since the pandemic started were absorbed by the capital plan. And so that has led to pent up demand for from the deferred equipment and projects. And it's caused aging equipment, which increased maintenance costs and decreases our trade values. So we're getting less for the vehicles we have, which is making the new vehicles cost more on top of inflation is making the vehicles cost more. So we're kind of getting hit from both sides here. So we are working to rebuild the multi-year equipment and infrastructure plans we had um, to factor in the deferred equipment purchases and try to get to a steady state funding goal. Um, I've been working with all the departments on the capital plan. Um, we all met internally today and the funding need is approximately 3.45 million for 26. That's a little higher than I had listed in my memo. Um, and so, and that's including a phased approach to getting paving up to a steady state of one to 1.2 million. I believe it's putting about 825,000 into the capital plan for 26 and it's moving it up. Um, and so it's same with a phased approach for trying to get municipal buildings steady state. Um, right now I've slotted in a half a percent in 26 of all of our building values so that we start to have a buffer for the big costs, roofs, the things that are coming down um, to us that we just don't have any money set aside for at the moment. Um, and so along with that, we funded CIP last year at 2.4 million. Our recommendation this year would be to increase that by 350,000 up to 2.75 million. Um, but obviously given the magnitude that we're seeing here, that's not going to be enough to catch us up. Um, so just briefly, um, because we've been talking about debt sum, our general fund debt policy is 8.2% of governmental funds. So this would include rec, parks, anything that is not enterprise. Um, our current ratios are under the 8.2%. And with factoring in um, a conservative estimate for <clears throat> excuse me, East State Street debt, we still are on the decline because we have other debt falling off. So that's good to see that we still have some um, free capacity for debt here, given our needs. Um, this next slide is all funds, which has the 15% of budgeted revenue. And this one too, you can see even with a conservative estimate on East State and the wastewater phase two, um, and I say wastewater phase two, this is without the extra 4.9. So they will be a little higher um, than this. I did not factor that um, 4.9 million in here from the prior bond, but they still are also trending downward because of other debt falling off in these funds. Um, and then I just wanted to note, I did not include the Municipal Climate Recovery Fund loan that we got from FEMA in this calculation at all, because that loan is being paid back with the reimbursements we're getting from FEMA. Um, so I, it shouldn't have an impact on our uh, debt repayment schedule. And then um, this is a listing all staff kind of pulled together about future debt. Um, obviously, we have East State and the wastewater plant uh, on here that are already voter approved that are 7.2 and 16.4 million. Um, we'll add the 4.9 million to the wastewater phase two, as Kurt mentioned, and with the option you all approved. We have an aging tower truck that needs to be replaced. Um, the community development agreement you were about to hear about tonight is another potential um, bonding opportunity. Um, we have the stump dump and we're not sure what that looks like at this point. So that could be more future debt. Um, 
there's a big Rialto bridge project coming. It's a state project. It's a approximately $10 million. We are responsible for 10% cost share on that project, as well as there will be water line and related streetscaping work in our master plan, right? It's in the master plan, the streetscaping work. Um, and so there will definitely need to be a bond for that, um, as well as any country club road development, recreation facilities, three acre permits, water line replacements, and other parks um, trail use and extensions. And so it's a pretty hefty list. Um, we just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of what could be coming in the future and give consideration to that in the debt policy. Um, finance is reviewing the debt policy. My plan is to bring that um, in the spring of 25 to you all to discuss changes. You know, I think we should um, differentiate how we account for community development bonds and TIF district bonds um, in line with our capacity, which may involve adjusting capacity or setting, you know, percentages that are acceptable amounts for council for those. So those are just some of the things that could be coming in the debt policy. So um, before you go off this page, yeah. the one thing I didn't recognize on this page was three acre permits. Could you tell us what that is? You know, <laughs> that's the one I am not the best person to explain. Current left. And the people who could explain it are here, but it has to do with stormwater. Right. Okay. Um, so and there are some significant city, city stormwater names. Three acres or more have to comply with state stormwater regulations, and some of those require, um, you know, infrastructure to deal yeah. with that. So obviously, Country Club Road, the Stump Dump. Some of our fields, some of our rec facilities, rec, rec so, area, yeah, right. So we have a you know fair amount of areas that need to to get three acre permits and then comply with the regulations. So some of those will need upgrades, and because we don't, we're working through that now. We don't know what those mm -hmm. will be because we haven't finished the yeah. process yet. Yeah. Are we on the hook for schools for that, or is the is that no, part of the school? school? That's them because we don't own. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. gotcha. Yeah, I, we just wanted to register that this could be a need because uh, we just don't know what level of work is going to be required and likely will be sizable. Um, and so really here, what we're looking for is guidance from you. Um, we are very, very early in this budget development process, but we'd like to gain as much information about goals and priorities and strategies as we can as we go into the full budget build. Um, I'm working on that right now to get that budget distributed to department heads. They will need to review and make adjustments and submit their operating budgets for 26. Our plan is to put the general fund budget in front of you guys Prior to our budget Congress on November 13th, we will follow the next two days meeting internally to try to meet your recommendations and, and cut from the areas that you deem that we should cut from or preserve the areas that are most important to you. So we just are looking for some guidance here. Um, and the direction in prior years has been to bring a budget in at CPI, which was 3.4 in our region. And at this level of funding, you know, we most definitely will not be able to cover all of the increases um, that we're going to see. So with that, you know, we'd like to hear more about your thoughts on this upcoming budget process and and any feedback you could give now would be helpful in the budget build. Thanks, Sarah. Any other questions? All right. Well, we we had this discussion. Uh, don't, don't everybody speak at once. We we've had this discussion, and we had this discussion last year at this time, or a little later in the year, which was the uh, uh, staff coming to us and saying, "Give us some guidance for what you want before we spend a lot of time doing it." And uh, and I don't think we gave them as much guidance as they were hoping for. And I think that was a source of frustration throughout the process. And so go ahead, Tim. Here within that five-year state education funding 
But, so basically, are we going to work a budget and then find out that the state's numbers are not favorable and they're going to be pushing us up like they have the last two years? I mean, because it's the state, I mean, that won't affect the city's budget, but the state the taxpayers, you know, the, I don't know but how there was an impact for us last year in terms of was it common level of appraisal? Was it, oh, it has to do with school funding. Right? Yeah, it, it didn't have anything to do with our funding, um, just the schools, the school funding, but it impacted the rate of our increases that we all encountered for our taxes yes so if in fact it definitely impacts the school tax rate right right so i mean that's a policy decision that you all have to make is how much you want to take that into account of the city's tax rate we that com that stuff doesn't affect the city's portion of the budget other than the final bill that we get obviously which is big i mean i'm not downplaying that i'm just we have no Right. We don't control what they choose to do and how the school handles it, other than mm -hmm. it what affects, we choose to accommodate their issues in our budget. It affects the bills that people get in the mail, but yes, it doesn't change anything we're able to spend or required to spend on our side of the budget, on the city side of the budget. Well, if I may, I, I think I think you're curious, as am I, if we're going to get hit with another big school tax increase, even though it doesn't affect our budget, it affects the wallets right. of our constituents. Of the people that pay our budget. Right. No, that's right. It, yeah. For sure. And, and we probably don't know that yet. But we don't know that yet. We, we hope, you know, we will let. We're going to be sharing budget information with the school we we actually had talked about a joint meeting right at the very beginning sounds like they're more interested in doing it in january at some point mm. when we're you know have some sense of where everybody's going to think, but you know we'll I mean, we will track and see what their budget proposal is because you know it's public information we'll share that with all but you know they're going on at the same time going to the same end day so it's you know sometimes it's just hard to keep up with what they're doing but i mean you're right it's you know it's a it is all a bottom line that the taxpayers pay. And so the question, the policy question for the council is, you know, are we are, are we going to adjust the services that we deliver because of what they're doing? You know, I don't know that they ever say we're going to cut school costs because the city's budget's going up. So, but that's, you know, still, I, I don't know how much attention they pay to the city side of things, but yeah. obviously it's a different group, so. So, well, I I mean, uh, the sort of preliminary thinking I've been doing about this, I I know the, I think the police staffing has been, um, is something we need to pay attention to this year. Um, so I, I think we need to we need to preserve. If not, I I don't I think they they're actually short short handed now. So I think we need to restore that, particularly given the very long list of calls that I've been seeing lately in the reports. You know, the other thing is, um, you remember the people paving and pizza thing. I think people are, they know that taxes are going to, you know, continue to go up and they'd be a lot happier if the roads were paved, you know, to pay those taxes. Um, so, I mean, I'd like to see us make an effort to, to get back to a, a you know, to restore the paving budget. You know, we probably can't do it all at once, but, um, I, you know, we still get a lot of complaints about that. I, I just think people will be, will be um, may, may not even notice the other <laughs> increases if the, if the roads are paid. Yeah, uh, right now we are contemplating either a three year or four year to get us up to that 1.2 of steady state. We're also still waiting on the results from LIDAR to see um, what our paving index is and Which where, would to decide where to, where we where, do it. Where yeah. to do it next. Yeah. Um, so though we should have those results soon, I believe. Um, but it is a big jump to go from 650,000 in funding for paving in one year to 1.2 in the next. And so we're trying to take a, a thoughtful phased approach to getting up to steady state, knowing we have deferred maintenance and we have limited capacity as staff. So we want to make sure we've paired that all well together. And and just on that, um like I said, we're trying to get also want to have the the um capital and equipment committee 
more active this year. You know, last year, again, we were scrambling. We had one meeting. It was kind of a fait accompli. I'd like to get, so we, we put together a staff starting draft today uh, and like to get a meeting or two to have that committee work through it so that at either November 13th or, and or on the 20th, was at the Capitol plan to the full council for discussion, understanding that those numbers may have to change when you see you know the whole budget, but at least this is, we're all together where we're trying to get to, as opposed to us just saying, here's what we thought you'd want to do. So we, we you know, we, we have the benefit of time this year that we didn't have last year. So, and, and some experience at the, you know, not only her first budget, but the first budget with flood crunch going on. So if I, if I may, just one more thing, I'm, I'm also curious to know how the, uh, overtime strategies panned out, uh, whether they worked, whether it was neutral. Um, it, it was sort of an, another odd year for that. Yeah, um, it's a little early, but we do see that um, fire and dispatch are trending hot in overtime right now. So we're working on how to address those items and try to get that back in line with budget. And the evening DPW shift? Because oh, that is that is the winter has yet to come. Yeah. Uh, and there has been a lot of resistance to that um, mm -hmm. from the staff. Uh, that, as you know, we won't, that's not something we were trying to institutionalize it in the contract, and we weren't able to successfully do uh, that, which is why we did the one year agreement to keep talking about it. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be a, it's going to be a challenge. It's hard hard for departments to keep a lid on overtime when they're down staff. Yeah. And especially, you know, the police is a big deal. I, I'm with Sal. I think police is very important to uh, meet the uh, public safety and not only public safety, but there are human services issues that uh, the police be, by default are are thrust into. And so it's, it's important to do that. I definitely think uh, paving is very important and um i i think that uh, in looking at the cuts that were in the budget in this year's budget and uh, uh your draft is restoring them in uh in fiscal 2026 i feel very strongly that we should uh restore the cuts that the uh, department heads took took in their salaries this year I, I i don't think it's you know uh, by foregoing the increase i don't i don't think it's a good thing to be asking people to work year after year without having uh having their salaries go up and so what i would i what i would be looking for is bringing them in fiscal 2006 26 to where they would be if they got the raise this year and then uh, again in uh, next year seems like stepping back into this like we just feels, feels like we just finished it <laughs> and remembering how painful that experience was the rates of increase that people have been encountering in the community for the most part. And there are a few categories within the um, the new tax assessment system that didn't go up as much, like condominiums. But for the most part, I've seen a lot of homes that were in the twelve to $14,000 a year range, and now they're in the 18 plus range. I mean, taxpayers are really, and I know it's not just us at schools, but it is us too. And I think back to that conversation last year, if we look at our essential services and what we must provide, what are our essential services as a community, and which ones are we have more discretion over? As much as nobody wants to give up anything, I think it's time to say, rather than do a million small cuts to, to all our basic essentials and not get them right, should we look at something bigger and just make an adjustment? I mean, do you look at you know, for a town of under 8,000 with what, roughly 1,900 people actually paying taxes, um, and you look at the burden, do we have to say, can we handle a rec department? You know, can we run a senior center? I mean, it, is there one of these more discretionary areas that's not essential services that, I hate to suggest it, but it may be something in that league to get this under control? Because we know we've got the capital costs 
facing us. I mean, it, it's we've talked about it over and over, but and we have to tackle those. I mean, we just hitched up a water line on School Street. What did they say? The the main line on Main Street they tapped into, they thought was put in in 1912. I mean, it, it, that's what we're dealing with. It's tough, what, but what would it, your target be? A million, two million? <laughs> I guess I'd have to go back and look at the budget and see uh, what. I guess, so I, but it's not going to be three hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I think the the question for me is, you know, I it's a little early to actually put a hard number on it till we we yeah. can get it. But how how would we have that conversation? Like, what process do you want to follow that allows adequate time to have that kind of policy conversation? I think that's, you know, how do we we're not going to just talk top of our head tonight say here's this but if that's really something that the council wants to have then there needs to be time carved out in, in the process for that i mean maybe just you know, start thinking about it now we'll talk about it again another one but you know what, what we want to do is you know obviously meet your needs fund the strategic plan the priorities that you've identified stay within the guidelines that you try to set for us and make sure that you get the opportunity to get the information that you, you need and want. You know, last year we did videos of the departments. Do you want the departments to come in and meet with you? Like, how, how do you want to review the budget so that you feel you have adequate information to make decisions? And I, like I said, I know it was rushed last year and put combination of, you know, flood, we had some new council people, and, you know, every, it was kind of worse confluence of, you know, trying to do pull a budget together um so fortunately this year you know everyone's done it once but that's how, a good question how do we how do we use our time the best to to, to do that and i think that's what we're because then we can set a process up based on what we want to do well i'm thinking of all the um questions i asked about things that that we couldn't change you know like the union contract has been set and these numbers are set and they're they're just a line item in the budget, but it's nice to have those separated somehow so that we're looking at stuff that we can actually affect and things that are set, things that are not changeable. We don't, we, we just don't waste time looking at it, talking about it, asking about it. Is it possible to do that? To Just sort those the... nickels that are left over. I think that's a difficult question um, to be able to provide that. I think. Well, I, I can think, I was thinking, I think we can do that a little bit, but you know, even that. So, okay. So, you know, obviously debt for sure and leases, yeah. contracts, anything that we have like that, you know, union agreements will define, um, how much you know the working conditions and what we have to pay people and those kind of things they don't necessarily control how many people are in those departments mm -hmm. um that said last year last year the message was you know our three union departments police fire and public works was you know like we don't really want to cut those so okay. if if that's still where we're at then so that then the amounts that those folks get are kind of set although there are no contracts in place for the budget we'll be talking about, but we'll be doing, that'll be another fun task to be doing next, this coming spring is negotiating those agreements. Um, so, you know, and then there are the fixed costs, you know, and then there are just things like the, you know, well, how much we choose, we collectively choose to put into the capital plan, you know, that right. once we put that in, you know, the projects within it might change, but the amount, you know, we try to fund a certain amount and then there are, you know, then there's just things like salt and sand that, you know, you, we have played that game in the past. We say, well, we'll just see if we can get by by cutting salt, you know, 20,000. And then you have a bad winter and you use it anyway. And, you know, last year, Sarah, one of, one of the reasons we had a tough budget year last year is because Sarah did a really good job of going through all the operating lines in the budget and getting them to actually reflect what we really spent versus, you know, a wishful list of right. well, to see if we can keep it at this. So we had to, you know, we absorbed a lot of that last year. So 
you know, so yeah, we can, we can try to identify those, but you know, some of it is discretionary, but some of it's like, it's, you know, how well do you want to pay, you know, maintain the roads in the winter? How well do you want to respond to certain things? How, how much safety equipment do you want our public, you know, our first responders to have? And some of those aren't, you know, when you think about them in those lines, they're not that discretionary. They're kind of like, yeah, we really need to do this. So then it becomes, do we do certain projects and Mm -hmm. Or then there's the list that Sarah gave you of those items that we all we took out of the budget last year. And those are all important policy initiatives, but they are all discretionary that we can put in either at the same amounts or different amounts. Mm -hmm. That's Adrian. Yes, I'm gonna try to have a intellectual thought at this hour. <laughs> um so kind of uh, tagging on to that, I think this will be my first budget season, so I haven't felt the pain of last year or what your process has been, but I, I would like to have a process for this and, and think about, you know, we talk about essential core services, but really kind of defining what that means to us as a council, as a city, so that we have like, we start bucketing stuff, like kind of what you were saying, Bill, like, how do you bucket this? It's hard to bucket everything we do but is there some way that we could put parameters around at least categories you know starting with you know what are our essential core services that we cannot live without like we must have this is like absolutely not negotiable for us as a city um you know what are the things that we can't change that we have no control over it's outside of our sphere of control it's something that's part of the budget we can't touch like put that to the side and then, you know, have a list of projects to negotiate based on, you know, our overall budget and the gaps that we have and what we need to reduce. Um, but, you know, it could be projects, it could be programs. I mean, I think we do have to have these conversations and I, I would like for these conversations to be structured in a way that, um, I don't know, I just, I just don't want it to be like chaos. <laughs> And just like picking stuff off the budget and saying, I don't want this. I don't want this. So I, I don't know if we need to have a further discussion around process, but I'd like, I'd like for there to be a process for this. And there absolutely can be one. I think we need to think very like strategically and, and thoughtfully so that we are making decisions based on data and not necessarily how we feel about things. You know, one, one of the things that I, um, and thinking about what Bill asked is that for the last couple of years, we've had the uh, department heads do these videos, um, but but that means that there's a number of people on the council who've not heard a direct present budget presentation from each department head with the opportunity to ask questions. And so it, I do think it might, might be worthwhile to, I, I thought the videos were good, but I think might be time to uh, again have uh, have all the department heads come in, you know, once budget Congress is over and you come up with a recommendation to have department heads come in and uh, do a presentation and engage in conversation with the uh, with the council. That's one of the things that part one of my recommendations. So that has a, that has been um, productive in the past. I would tell you that if we're going to do that, we probably want to add a, another meeting to the schedule. Um, just because, you know, depending, I mean, if you just do the big departments, then the other departments still get heard. It, you know, it, it can it it adds up when you start. It's, it's, you know, you do police and fire and you're here all of a sudden three hours or more has gone by. You do DPW with capital and water and sewer. And that's, that's a nice, that's a long thing. I, I, well worth the time, I'm not, but that one of the reasons we went to the videos was so that people could watch them on their own time and then just have the follow up questions if they wanted to. I I actually do think the in-person things work, but then even if you take 
you know, finance clerk planning, you know, to, you add a few of those together. That's a, that's a whole, way, right. So, um, so I, I'm seeing some about people it, but, nodding though. Okay. I mean, that's fine. So I just, you know, right now we have, so, so, We would just, yeah, I, I, you know, so then the question is, do we want to add, you know, we, we, we've basically taken, starting from the time we bring the budget in on December 11, we've taken every reasonable Wednesday through to the 22nd, other than the holidays. And I, I as much as I'd like to meet more, I don't think we ever, you know, we want to meet people, just you all, and we all deserve that time. So do we pick another night during the week? You know, two nights, a month, you know, we have to work around other, but to see what other groups are meeting, like planning commission, and we work around that, but like a, a Monday and Wednesday, or would you like us to come back with some proposals for that? Yeah, Carrie? Yeah, um, I, I want to speak against the idea of having in-person presentations from all the departments. <laughs> um, I think the videos are a good way to go, and then we can ask questions as we need to. Also, we did go through a, this really comprehensive process in our strategic planning during this past year, where we had all these presentations. We had different part; every different part of the city came in and and gave us a presentation in person. So, and that wasn't very long ago, and we've all been through that. So, I think we're okay not doing that. Um, what about people who haven't spoken yet? Palin, Tim, you're on board for the in-person. So am I. Palin, where are you on that? Person is good. And you prefer, you would prefer it even if it takes more time? Even if it takes more time, but eventually it takes more time anyway, right? Like the budget discussion, whatever we do, really takes uh -huh. more time. So uh -huh. my idea is still same. I don't want to have huge raise in tax. Uh, and I don't want to cut so many things from the core responsibilities of the city. And I know it is impossible <laughs> to create budget like that. But if we can get closer to that it will be enough for me so okay. if everybody thinks that we need additional meetings it's fine fine by me okay adrian yeah i don't i don't think we need additional meetings i feel like we just met with everybody like carrie said i feel like we had the tour everyone came in they gave their presentations i feel very comfortable with you know, we can go back and look at the slides that everyone presented. I mean, those were really long. And what are they going to present, right? So if, unless there's like a very like succinct presentation that's five minutes or less saying, you know, you can go back to back to back and say, hey, this is what we need. These are our current like top, you know, you can prioritize the top three, you know, requests from each department it could be five minutes each it's not like i don't think we need a three-hour presentation from dpw um i think i mean even they just send it to us we can just review it and then we start making some informed decisions based on i just really want to make some like data informed decisions and not just pick stuff out of the out of the air um, so I do think we need to hear from them, but I think it can be in a very controlled, succinct, effective manner <laughs> that doesn't, you know, take up too much of our time. Sal, what's your thought? Oh, I'm sorry. What about they record their presentations and we can watch whenever we have time? So we can't put it like a done, deadline. Like we did last year. Yeah, like deadline and just like, okay, we have to decide by then, so finish the presentations by then, but everybody can record. So like a create a video. So we don't have additional meetings. We don't have to really give up uh, most of our city council uh, meeting time. So. Okay, thanks, Palin. Sal, do you have a thought? 
I, I uh, the, the videos are okay with me. It's you know it's nice to be able to do it on your own time. I think there's a value in in person stuff. I mean, I, I don't know what's easier on the staff. I mean, they they also have at the end of the day have to come to another meeting, but yeah, I mean they also have to put together a video. So. Right. I mean, I, I can't speak for everybody. I think, you know, sure, less meetings is is good. I But they, you know, the videos we can do during the working day and we can, you know, we, we, you know, we've gotten a little better at them each year. I think we'll, you know, Evelyn's got it down. We can put more graphics mm -hmm. and information in them to make them, you know, easier to watch. Um, so I, I don't, you know, I think it's I, mostly, I think, I think I speak for the staff when I say they want to make sure that, that they're heard and that, you know, the opportunity exists because, you know, video is one way. And if you have follow-up questions, they want to make sure that they have an opportunity to answer them and that, you know, assumptions aren't. And, you know, just, to, you know, to Adrian's point, I'll just point out for everybody, you know, I mean, yes, it's good. It's always good to have decisions that are data-driven and really your budget is about setting your priorities. Like, so those are policy decisions and, so you obviously data can help inform those, but at the end of the day, it's kind of like what, you know, Tim was saying, like, this is more important than that. This is what, you know, where you put your money is where you set your priorities. And so we're allocating our resources this way. This is how we recommend the voters. So there's, there is usually a little bit of subjectiveness to that, a little bit of judgment. This is, I think this is, you know, four of us think this is more important than three of us do, you know, I mean, it's just how it goes. So. Uh, mm -hmm. Tim, did you yeah, I'm getting it down from 70 things. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. not, it's hard to prioritize. Right. Uh, Adrian. Oh, sorry, Tim, would you use I want My only thing is there's layers in this process and trying to be sensitive to our time, but also staff and what everyone's going through to generate this budget. And so you're doing budget Congress, separate meetings, and then they prepare videos for us, which I don't know, true confession, I didn't watch all of them. And then <laughs> our meetings, I, could would it make sense if we work together in that budget Congress layer and skip and not well, need so many follow up layers? It, yeah, I mean, I think you know what happened. The budget Congress is a fancy name. I mean, the, the, the way the process goes, if you look at our chart, you know, the, the city manager presents a recommended budget to the council. Basically, that's mm -hmm. that's what it is. The budget Congress is, you know, our staff getting together, essentially advising the what my recommended budget should be. I mean, we do it collaboratively. At the end of the day, we come up with a decision, but then inevitably after we conclude, we get more information. You know, last year we got an insurance information that was another 100,000 after we, you know, so we just, I had to make decisions about where we found that, you know, because we couldn't read it. So we, it takes us, well, it depends on the year, but it's, you know, it's important. I think it's a good process for us as a team, as a management team, leadership team to get together. And so what, what you'll be kind of doing this year differently is the night before we start that we'll be basically sharing with you. This is, these are the real numbers we're going to be talking about the next two days. So it's kind of your chance to be, you know, sort of in that room a day in advance saying, well, if it was me, this is what I would do. You know, this is where I see the priorities and, you know, we won't be pushing back on you at that point. So, but then if, if we, I mean, at the end of the day, you have final say, but if, you know, some point we might say, you know, I'll pick on Derek because he's here, but, you know, so now I think the fire department could do without, you know, working 24 hours and you would just say that and we discuss that and we'd come back and say, well, here's the importance of working the 24 hours. So we looked at that. This is what it would cost. Here's the cost that, you know, we won't be able to analyze all that, but at least to get a sense of where, because, you know, one of the reasons we're asking this question, and I think it should be obvious from, you know, Sarah's, is this is, it's going to be really difficult. I mean, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a big number that we're starting with. And everything, you know, everything that is in that budget for a reason, it's not, you know, we don't, we try not to waste money, right? There's, the positions are there for reasons. That list of things we cut last year are all important things we want to get done in, in the community. So, you know, every service we provide has a constituency. They've got, you know, people that support it and want it and need it and have come to count on it. So we want to make sure that 
the work we have ahead of us, which is going to be brutal for all of us, is done in a way that we can all, you all can consider it and get the info that you need to make your buying decisions. I get it. But having sold my business within the last few yeah. years, one thing I learned is I did do a lot of things over and over because I was comfortable with it. Right. And that's the way I did it. And when you have to like stop the treadmill yeah. and look at every step and everything you're doing, it is amazing how many things you're doing that, yeah, they're nice things and they're important. And at one time, maybe they were even more important than now, but it builds up and there's a lot more in there than you realize that, that are things you're paying for, things you're writing, layers you built up that you don't use as much anymore. Yeah. And it's like, how do we get to that level? And it's really hard to do it while you're running. Right. But um, having been through it, it's just astounding. Completely and, agree. In fact, it's like, just, how do we get to that place? Yeah, we were just talking about you know, doing a staff retreat about our internal processes and what mm -hmm. what can go and what's a you know, product of another year, another time. So yeah, you know. We, reviewing the tech account will be interesting because yeah. things have changed a lot. Yeah. Okay, I want to get to, to Adrian and, and Lauren online. Yeah, I think just to reiterate what Bill said was, you know, as a council, we are helping to set priorities. So, you know, we should be very thoughtful about what our vision is. So where are we going in the next one, five years, right? So what are the priorities that are really, really important to us? And how does it align to the strategic plan? And if it doesn't align to the strategic plan, that could be, one thing that is not funded. And so I think we need to do a side-by-side -side of the strategic plan, making sure it aligns with the budget and then following up when Tim says, there could be stuff in that budget that has been legacy, that has just been a part of how we've done business for a long time because that's totally normal, but maybe it's just not what we do anymore. So I think it is a good time to pause even though we do need to make obviously critical decisions. And this, this sounds like a daunting, horrible process that I'm not super excited to, to go into. You guys aren't selling the budget season, but um, like, I think if we really think about what we want Montpelier, Montpelier to look like in five years, we stay very laser focused on our priorities and we make sure that it's aligned to the strategic plan. If it's not part of those, then we have the decision I think a pretty easy to decision to to not fund it. I don't know what that is though, but that is like for me, those are like pretty clear parameters. Thanks, Adrian. Uh Lauren. Yeah, thanks. Um I think like part of the challenge last year was the staff had done it, came back and and then we gave direction of like, we really want to focus on like public works and, you know, a couple of departments, police. And so then having to go back and like, well, the conversation at the Congress would have been different. So I, I think what I'm hearing is when we have the November 13th meeting, um, like my hope is that as a council, like we're, we are all reviewing the strategic plan. We're coming in. If there are specific ideas that people have, like, I mean, I don't imagine to use Tim's examples, like any of the department heads are going to be like, well, we could just eliminate my department. Um, and so I think it's the onus is on us to say, where do where do I feel like it's not an essential service? And like, I think we need to be bringing those lists because I don't think that's really fair to ask the staff to to do that. So I would say, let's come in with what are those things that, you know, if like the bigger conversations that anyone wants to have, um, and then on a, on a smaller level, I do think using the strategic plan as a good guide for some of the things that feel perhaps more optional, but like, you know, investing in homelessness services this coming year might be critically important given like where we are and, and whatever, um, just as an example. So, but to me, it's also just so helpful to have the staff go through the process because sometimes and like come up with their recommendations for each of the departments of like what would be on the top list of things that could get pushed. Cause it's not always obvious. Sometimes it's like, well, that thing, there's actually like a grant proposal that we put in that we haven't heard yet or whatever. So like, it's, it's just very informative to understand like what would really be problematic to not fund in the coming year and what, um, you know, what really there's something like on track that's going to really set us back. And it's not, I, I think it's hard for as counselors to always know all those details. So I just, it's really helpful to get kind of their list of like, what would go first on your list staff? And then, um, you know, as another layer of it. 
Thanks, Lauren. Well, Tim, I'm not hearing as much support for our idea of having everyone come in in person. So I think uh, we'll watch <laughs> this year, watch the videos, but but come prepared with questions. Um, Bill, is this, are you, are you getting any closer to where you wanted to be? Wanted to be? I sure. Feel free to say no, but no, I, I, I think what I will do is so I, you know, um, this has all been really helpful. You know, we will be talking about this next meeting. So maybe we'll outline the suggested process based on this conversation and you can react to that. That might help. Um, Great. Yeah. Sounds good. You know, we're, yeah, it's after 11 and yep. I don't, know that you're getting nope, more exactly. out of this council tonight on that topic. So that mo moves us to council reports. Uh, Lauren. Pass. Did you say pass? Yeah, sorry. Pass. Okay, Palin. Okay. I thought you are going to the uh, uh, online. Okay, so... Um, I want to thank Evelyn and City uh, to announce the youth committee. So for the press release, and also there was a post on front for forum. And after we posted on there, uh, they reached out to me and Evelyn, and they told that uh, after seeing that announcement, front porch forum decided to change their membership age, and now it is 14 and up. So it's a huge... I don't know. I, I got very excited about it because it's it's a great thing for youth and our youth committee is already creating some momentum, although we haven't started working yet. We are just accepting the application. So I just want to share this with all of you. And also I appreciate Front Porch Forum to support uh, youth voice in our community. Thank you. Thanks. Tim? Just two things I've had on my list, and as we head for budget process, it would be nice. It'd be good, I guess. It's I think the last one I found was just an update for what we've got in the Country Club Road property. Um, last update I found, and that was in January. So maybe as we go into budget, it would be nice to just how much have we got into that project at this point? Um, and the other one is just to remind people that we've got the RFP out to sell that site on 12 Main Street, and uh, I think it's a really good opportunity in town. And I'm not sure how the word's getting out about it, but um, we could use the money. <laughs> so, uh, Carrie? No report. Adrian? No report. All right, thank you. Uh, for the mayor's report, I just have two items. One is that uh, we're coming up to the last weekend of uh, The Tempest at Lost Nation Theater. I haven't, haven't seen it yet, but for many years, they did fall foliage Shakespeare every year. It's great to see them getting back to putting in a, a Shakespeare show in the fall. And two, just to follow up to the discussion about the Country Club Road property uh, this evening. It was a very long discussion, but I thought it was a good and worthwhile discussion. And because the question came up about... Uh, the potential sale of a portion of the property. The uh, council will be scheduling a formal tour of uh, <clears throat> of the land and what we're looking for, and that will be warned as a special meeting of the council when we do that. We have I have no idea when that's going to be yet, and that's all I've got. City clerk. Oh, just if anybody's <laughs> curious, we banked about two thousand votes already at this. Wow. which is uh, actually a little slower than I'd hoped, but it's still, I'm not complaining. <laughs> City manager. Well, thanks. Um, I was hoping to pass, but no. Uh, first of all, we did pat, we did skip the strategic plan report tonight and just to remind you to read it, that's kind of our progress report. So take a look at that. We probably won't do it. Um, we are trying to schedule both the capital plan committee and the legislative uh, committee uh, sent out please to you also if you want to get back to me with thoughts about dates that would be really helpful and then just 
maybe you can give me some guidance here, but as a result of tonight, our next meeting right now, which is on November 13, uh, would include um, a discussion of camping uh, at some portion of CCR, of Country Club Road, the tax stabilization policy, the development agreement, the tax appeals. Green Mountain Tr in Transit was supposed to come in to sort of give us an update on their routes and their budget needs for the year, which I thought would be a good match with our budget presentation. And then ideally we'll be presenting a legislative agenda as a result of the committees. And then I think we're also gonna appoint youth committee people. So I just note that it's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> and um, so if there's anything people wanna reschedule on that or it can be rescheduled, you know, we already posted a couple things. Um, I just, you know, I might, the budget discussion, I think we should make sure we have time for because it's going to be weighty. And I suspect that if we, you know, that that a discussion about opening camping on Country Club Road will also take up a lot of time because there's going to be questions about how do we manage it? How do we, you know, I don't know. We, we don't have the wherewithal to do it. So, mm -hmm. so just I told you now. Bring your sleeping bag, <laughs> rest up before the meeting, you know. I have a quick question. Development agreement and the tax appeal is enough for one meeting. It could be. Yeah, yeah. but we don't we don't have that luxury. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, the right. The the tax stabilization, well, see the thing that's driving those both of those is those are both potential um ballot items in March. So got to kind of deal with those and and you know at some point we have to address the tax appeals and gmt i don't think will be that long they'll just go we yeah so, adrian i think we just need to be efficient yeah okay. it's my do we just have one meeting in november november 13 and november 20 oh two weeks in a row and then you get thanksgiving week off oh, we my... decided not to have a meeting the night before Thanksgiving. Yeah, I know my calendar is yeah. all messed up. Thank and you. November twenty. So some of this could, some of this could go maybe on November twenty. But the idea of, was that we would then talk about the capital plan on November twenty, and then that was going to be kind of a catch up for stuff that we hadn't gotten to. So you know, take a look at how we how plan how it out. out. Yeah, because and the other thing I was thinking about for November twenty is if we adopt a legislative agenda on the thirteenth, that we invite our legislators in on the the 20th. Yep. So that we don't have to have them in during budget season. Yeah. Cause I, it sounds like we're going to need full, like really nothing else on our agenda on budget nights. I think that's right. Yes. And that's it. <laughs> that's it. All right. Um, we are adjourned at 11, 16 PM. Thank you everybody. <laughs>